Welcome to this program on responding to and investigating suspected pesticide related bee kill complaints produced by the US Environmental Protection Agency. This is Camille Lukey with EPA Region 3, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. This is day one of our two day webinar. Today on the agenda, we will be hearing about bee biology and health, declines from varroa and other challenges to survival, registered products for in hive use how to interpret hive declines during inspections, and an overview of the EPA bee kill inspector guidance. Please note that the views expressed by our presenters are for educational purposes only and do not represent the official views or positions of EPA or the presenters' organizations. Before we begin, here are a few tips for viewing our webinar. To toggle between a maximized and standard view of the presentation, click on the four corner symbol highlighted by the blue arrow or highlighted by the yellow arrow. If you are having technical difficulties, press the raise your hand icon highlighted by the blue arrow and we will do our best to help. To download the PDF version of the presentation, press the paper icon highlighted in green. The agenda and EPA inspection guidance will also be available in the handout section. Please note that all participants' mics will, be, will remain muted during this event. To pose a question, use the question box shown with the red arrow. We are collecting all the questions sent today in the question box and we'll present them to our panelists during the discussion tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For the remaining questions that we are unable to address in the panelist discussion, we will send out a Q&A document to all registered attendees. That being said, we encourage you to send your questions in the question box as they come up. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Megan Milbrath, who will be presenting on bee biology and health. Dr. Megan's work focuses on honeybee disease epidemiology and honeybee medicine. She has a degree in biology from St. Olaf College a master's of public health from Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, and a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She also has been a beekeeper for over 20 years and runs a queen rearing business and honey farm in Jackson County, Michigan. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Megan. Thank you so much for the introduction and also thank to all the organizers for putting this on and um, giving us all the opportunity to talk and share the information about bees. Um, so I was given an agenda today to make sure that I didn't overlap with people. And it was actually a bit of a difficult um, presentation for me to put together just because I feel like it could be about four years long instead of 45 minutes long. Um, so it's really designed to be an overview. I was told that um, the target audience was people who had no experience with bees um, and I will be a panelist as well. So I'm happy to follow up on any of these topics as well. So I'll go over quickly the life cycle of an individual bee and then the life cycle of the honeybee colony and how they relate to each other. Um, with a particular focus at the end of how they can be affected by pesticides, parts of a managed hive that inspectors may encounter, biology of foraging behavior and pesticides that may be acquired via foraging, and how forage quality can affect individual health and colony growth. So I really only focus on colony growth, and then symptoms of inadequate forage and nutrition. So this is what I'll be starting on, but um, like I said, it'll be just kind of a, a breeze over all of these things. So first, on the individual bee, and actually really to get some um, topics so or some words correctly. So on the left, you see a hive, and then we use the term colony to describe the animal that's inside, the superorganism. Um, even I myself sometimes mix these terms up because you'll talk about like applying a treatment to a hive and it's like, are you putting it in the box or on the animal? But by and large, this is what I'll try to use. And mostly, 
And you can see there's lots of asterisks because this is beekeeping, which is biology, so not everything always works the same. But generally, each stack of boxes or each hive will contain one animal or one colony inside. Um, we sometimes have two queen systems and things like that where people can get fancy. Um, but but by and large, it's kind of each one of these can be considered separate individual animals. And then within each one of those hives and within each colony, you're going to have different members. So we'll have the queen, we'll have drones who are the males, and we'll have workers who's basically everybody else that wasn't circled in that photo. And I'm going to talk briefly about each of them individually. So workers, queens, and drones, you can see they're all physiologically different. Um, the workers and the queens are females, so they are different castes. And then even within the workers, there's different castes depending on if they're a summer worker or a winter worker. And then drones are going to be the males, and they um, are just going to serve a reproductive role. And one way I've heard them described is just carriers of the gen genetics of the queens. So drones have no father. They only have the queen as the mother. So she basically lays an unfertilized egg, which has one set of genes, and that's what turns into that drone. Um, if she's laying a worker, she's going to lay a fertilized egg, so it will have her set of genes and then the genes of whatever drone she's mated with. So drones are made out of unfertilized eggs. They are only made when there's sufficient resources that they can focus on reproduction. So if you go back to like old psychology and hierarchy of needs, it still pertains where you have, you know, if a colony is starving to death, they're not gonna put effort into drones. Um, there is an except exception as like a last gasp when they're um, dying. Um, or if they're hopelessly queenless, but by and large, in a normal healthy colony, they're going to focus on their needs, they're going to look at the incoming food, and if there's a lot of incoming resources and they have enough to share, and they have ensured colony survival, then they'll put effort into um, putting some of that protein into drone development. So in North America, this is largely spring through fall. So where I am in Michigan, we'll start to see them in like April and then, um, and that's when we have good resources. They take about two weeks to mature. And then at that point, they go out on daily flights and they try, they go to an area called a drone congregation area. And they will try to find a virgin queen that will be on her um, mating flights. And if they are successful, they will mate with the queen, but that will involve them to lose part of their body and they will fall to the ground and die. If they're unsuccessful, then they will go back to the colony and they will get fed, hang out, try again the next day until fall, in which they get kicked out um, by winter time so that they don't use up excess resources. And that's basically all I'm going to talk about drones for the whole rest of the time. Um, the queen is going to be much more important in terms of colony survival. So the drones are really only if the colony feels like they can reproduce. The queen is going to be there all of the time. And she plays um, a much more important role in that she's the only sexually developed female in the hive. She does not make decisions. So she doesn't have like a ruler. She's a little poorly named in that. Her role is just an egg layer, so she, and she can lay up to thousands of eggs a day, and it is a actual huge, huge, huge protein um, usage in how many eggs that she will lay compared to her body weight per day. Um, and then she also, you know, her jobs are to lay eggs and to basically stink up the place, and so she has... Um, scent glands on her feet. She has scents that will cover on the eggs. She has very strong scents in her mandibles. And her walking around the hive and walking on the comb and laying lots of eggs is provides very strong information for the rest of the workers so that they can pick up and they know that the colony is queen right. Um, if the colony were to die, then the workers, so for example, if the beekeeper switched her or if she got a disease or if she got affected by pesticides or if it's just old age, then the workers will sense that they will immediately take a, another egg 
that is fertilized, so another female, and they will raise up a new queen. That queen will go out on a mating flight. Hopefully she can find lots of drones, get well mated, come back to the hive and start laying. That is a dangerous opportunity. Um, and so she is uh, vulnerable to predation and things like that. And so sometimes she can get lost in that process and can die in that process, in which case the colony can become what's called hopelessly queenless and it will die. So if they don't have a good laying queen or beekeepers will use the term queen right, that is considered terminal for the colony unless it gets recognized and can get um, righted. All right, so the queen is reproductive, the drone is reproductive, the worker is the one that's actually going to do all of the work in the colony. Many, many duties are gonna be performed by workers. They care for the queen, so they actually will feed the queen, they'll remove her waste, they'll feed the brood, which is the collective term for the young, the eggs, larva, and pupa which I'll show you photos of. Um, they clean the nest, so they'll remove dead bodies from the nest. They um, remove dirt or spider webs or things that get in. They defend the nest. They do foraging, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, they'll recruit nestmates to food sources, which means they have dancing that they'll do. Um, they determine resource needs, so they'll be collecting different resources, propolis, water, nectar, and pollen and they'll be doing that by doing this constant assessment of what's in the hive. And then they'll also determine when to swarm. So I've talked about reproduction in terms of, you know, the queen will lay an egg, but the term swarming is actually colony reproduction. And so that's when the colony basically makes a bud of itself and starts a new colony in a new location. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's activity is driven entirely by the workers. Oops. So the worker life cycle more or less um, is you can see that the queen will lay an egg and you can see the egg is deposited in the cell. This is comb that's you know would be in a hive but this is sideways so this would be normally hanging vertically. And then it's a life cycle similar to you know a butterfly in that it's an egg. It emerges as a hungry, hungry caterpillar, in this case, a hungry, hungry larva, and then spins a cocoon and pupates and emerges as a full grown adult. So um, the life or the span of this for a worker is about 21 days. For a drone, it's a little longer. This process happens in 24 days. In a queen, it's much shorter. It happens in 16 ish days. Um, it's an egg for three days. It's a larva for six days. In that time that it's a larva, it goes from this itty bitty teeny tiny egg into the size of basically an adult bee. So it's an incredible rate of growth. So this is the period where they're eating all of the pollen and protein and needing to grow really fast. Then it spins a silk cocoon and then it's a pupa for a while and then it emerges as a full blown adult. And then once they close, which is what we call it when they emerge from the cell or from their cocoon, they perform different tasks. So they will clean the cells, they will produce royal jelly. This is very similar to mammals in that the bees have a gland that produces a very high fat, high protein substance. So mostly it's produced by the hyperpharyngeal gland in bees, but it is similar effectively to lactation. Then they perform or they will um, develop their wax glands and will make wax and then they'll become maybe a house bee and they'll move food and they'll be a guard and, or maybe an undertaker. And then at the end of the life, they're foragers. So during this is during the summertime, they basically move through their lives doing these high energy tasks to doing these high risk tasks. And because at the end of their life, they die from the troubles of the and the hard living that is being a forager. So when they're foragers, they fly through miles, they fly through very unsafe conditions, and basically they die. The more they forage, the earlier they're going to die. There are some um, feedback loops and some hormones that are what directs the bees to 
perform these duties. So within the bees, they have juvenile hormone that those levels change as they age. And then they also have, um, they pick up on signaling. So for example, ethyl oleate from older foragers that prevent the bees from foraging too early. So if a bee just emerged and started foraging right away, she would die a lot earlier and that would off offset the balance. And I'll talk more about these um, as well, because it is really important to see how the colony is able to maintain this balance. Um, but there are derivations from this. So for example, wax building is only at certain times of the season. So at this time of year where I am in Michigan, um, if I were to ask the bees to make wax, they would say, heck no, we're getting ready for winter. And I could put sheets of foundation and they would not turn them into comb at all. Um, but if I put them in in June, then all of those bees will be wax bees. So these are not things that are super um, strict. They also will be, um, it's flexible whether or not they go between honey processors and foragers. So when a forager comes back with a full load in her crop, she'll count the amount of time it takes for her to find a bee to receive it. It's basically like a loading dock. And if it takes too long for a bee to receive it, then she realizes there aren't enough bees working at the loading dock and she may be able to become a honey processor. Or if there's if it's too fast, then maybe she'll shake bees and they'll go out and be foragers. So even once she's a forager, you can go back and forth a little bit. And then also um, with winter bees, which I'll talk about specifically, is that when you've got bees that are born, you know, where I am in Michigan, basically right now, this last generation of bees is not going to be a nurse bee because there won't be any young to raise. Um, the bees are shutting down egg laying for winter time. And so this last generation, they're going to perform thermodynamics and at the end of their life, they're going to activate their hyperpharyngeal glands. So we do have these tasks that change with their age, but they are also um, flexible depending on the time of year and what's going on within the colony. And so the colony depends on having this homeostasis. So I have this picture of a river here because you know the river always goes by the water always goes by, but the river's always there. And it's very similar in a honeybee colony where a honeybee colony can live for many, many years, but it's always with this constant replacement. And so this flow of bees is very, very important. So in the summer, bees live maybe 40 days and the foragers die from old use, but that's not a big deal because we have this input of new bees. And so this healthy colony is in this homeostasis or balance. Um, and specifically with pesticides, which um, I'll have another figure that talks about this, is when we have, you know, too many bees that go out, you know, the water leaving that goes too fast and you don't, it's 21 days to have a new bee, you can't just replace that very quickly. Or if you have something that damages the young, that really upsets the balance in the colony. And a lot of those things aren't super obvious, even to a trained eye. And so understanding these dynamics of how many bees, bees you have of which ages are very important. All right, so this is really why I'm minimizing the effect of the individual bee. And I won't spend a lot of time talking about the dynamics of an individual bee because really the animal that we care for is the colony, which is the superorganism. So I'm gonna talk about now the life cycle of the colony. And I really like to focus on, so I teach a lot of honeybee medicine to veterinarians and veterinary students. I always have an open call for pets in bee costumes that people can send me. And I love this one because this um, adorable little dog is about the size of a honeybee colony. So when we're talking about honeybee medicine and when we're talking about feeding your bees or if we're talking about, um, you know, making sure they have access to water, it is similar that you would to other animals and just like another animal's body has to be in balance and maybe it can come into some shocks or handle some stresses it is really that whole body that has to be taken care of so honeybees are considered eusocial insects um, and there are certain characteristics that they have they have cooperative brood care and i'll talk about these specifically reproductive division of labor overlapping generations and um, because they have these three, they were considered eusocial or truly social insects. 
So what I mean by cooperative brood care is that you have all of the females of the species are sharing the burden of rearing the young and they do that whether or not it's their offspring or others. So in the case of these workers, these workers are not able to lay fertilized eggs. So when they're caring for all of these larvae, like you can see here, so they're feeding these open larvae in this photo, they're taking care of those even though at best they're a full sister, meaning that they share the same father and they share the same mother. At minimum, they share the same mother, but even if you switch the queen out and they had different genetics, the workers will still care for the brood that are within that colony um, in order to maintain or make sure that that colony is able to continue. Um, they also have the reproduction division of labor, which I spoke about. So some of them are um, doing reproduction while others are doing all of the other tasks. And then they have overlapping generations. So you'll always have some of the bees remaining to help the parents rear more siblings. So we always have this kind of flow running through the colony. And an individual bee, therefore, will not survive without the colony structure. So, you know, we look a lot into what affects, you know, the uh, health of an adult bee, um, which is important when we're examining the toxicology or the pharmacokinetics of different chemicals or different agrochemicals. But what is really important from the practical standpoint is whether or not that colony structure is maintained. All right. And just like other animals, the goal of that colony is eventually to reproduce. And I used the term swarming before. Here's a little tiny swarm, but basically a honeybee colony is going to want to survive the winter if you have a winter or I'm using the term winter because I'm in, in Michigan and it feels very much like it's coming but this can also be basically a period without food so in the southern part of the U.S. it can be a really dry period or it can be our winter um, but it, there'll be a period generally without having a lot of incoming food and then usually after that there's a period where the food comes in quite a bit you have a lot more flowers in bloom and then the colony will reproduce by swarming in the swarm, the old queen leaves with a whole bunch of bees and then tries to find a new location. And then the bees that are left behind, which could be a third or a half or um, that are going to leave, the bees that are left behind are going to raise up a new queen. And then hopefully that goes well. She goes out, gets mated, come back. And from one colony, you have two. Um, beekeepers try to manage this by making splits but we work with it. So I'm gonna use like classic spring. You've got this colony that overwintered and then food starts coming in, it's going to grow. And then the beekeeper is going to swarm the colony basically by splitting it into multiple colonies. And this is, this is people who are maybe stationary that are following this, but even people who are um, commercial beekeepers and moving around are going to be making splits um, usually it's after almonds when the colonies are big um, and have lots of food resources upcoming. And then in the summer, the, those colonies will grow themselves. They'll put on a lot of food. And in the fall, you'll generally take some of that food away because in a lot of places of the U.S. there is a true excess. And then that cluster will be small again and overwinter. And then the next year, both of those colonies can be split ideally if they don't die from varroa and they will um, grow over the summer you'll make lots of honey so this growth reproduction or reproduction growth surviving the winter is really what gets repeated over time and in the winter bees form a tight cluster it's not truly like hibernation um, in that the bees do this just kind of in and out depending on the temperature so you can see here this is a um, different style of hive from what is most common. And you can see the bees are in this tight cluster in the middle and you've got this nice heat in the middle and then um, they'll hang out there. Once it's warm, we say they break cluster and then they can go out and forage for food. So in the summer, like I said, they live for three to six weeks and die from foraging. In the winter, we've got bees that are living for three to six months and they become nurse bees at the end of their life cycle. So what we see in the hive in terms of dynamics is overlapping generations of bees that have very different life um, cycles. So I'm gonna pause a minute on this slide because there's a lot of information here. It's from 
Randy Oliver, scientificbeekeeping.com, and he has an article that goes with this too. What you can see on the x-axis is months of the year. He's in California, so this isn't going to be universal. And then on the y-axis, you see number of workers or cells of broods. This is young worker bees, basically. And you can see the ages are represented by different colors. So in the summer, June, July, August, you can see there's a lot of bees. We have this really big colony and the bees are, you know, various ranges. And then in the fall, we start to lose more and more and more bees. And the only thing we have are our winter bees left. So by springtime, we have these bees that are like six months older, not that old. They're, we've got bees that are quite a bit older um, and they are going to raise that next generation. So I like this because it really shows, you know, two main points is one is that change in population. So that colony naturally gets really big. And then it also shows that we have these two different groups of bees. We have these short-lived summer bees and many of these long-lived winter bees that get the bees through periods without food. All right. So this is the main review on the biology is that the colony grows over the entire year in preparation for swarming. And then they try to get enough food and comb drawn to survive the winter and enough honey. And then they raise a special generation of winter bees. And then that continues. All right. A lot of times when we're moving hives around, they don't necessarily have a winter. Um, and again, winter being defined by periods without food. And you know, one of the reasons they're moved around is so that they have food continuously, which means they also have brood continuously. So they have young bees coming in. So those colony dynamics might be quite different. Um, the other thing is it, they are often going to be fed much more. And so you'll have a lot of young bees. This is much better for the bees in terms of a nutritional standpoint. However, there is transport stress and then also not having a break in the brood, meaning that there's constantly brood in the colony, means that they don't get a break from the threat of brood diseases. Um, so there's costs and, and benefits to both. All right, and don't worry, I will speed up. I will make sure that I'm done, hopefully, in 15 minutes. Okay, so the parts of the hive that inspectors may encounter, um, most of the hives are going to be the standard Langstroth hive. And so you'll have these deep boxes, and then you'll have medium boxes um, with these lids. This is a maybe a more hobbyist style lid, but they will be made up with these frames. In each box, you're going to see the young, which I've talked about, the brood collectively. So you can see some eggs here and some larvae, and they're all going to be in an, together in an area called the brood nest in the colony. So here I've pulled out a frame and you can see that there's almost like a cross section of a sphere. And these are the little bee cocoons where they're pupating. And that cross section of a sphere is the part of the brood nest. So generally there's, you can see these all have like a circle here. The brood nest will be down below and the honey is stored above it. We do have some people that use horizontal style hives, but you basically flip this on its edge and you have the brood at one end and the honey right above it. Um, so here just are pictures of boxes and taking out frames. Um, a lot of times people will use the measurement of a cluster count to take out the frames. Um, and to see how much you have in there. You'll also, when you're inspecting, you'll be able to get a, most of your information from outside the hive and a beekeeper. So this is a pesticide investigation. Um, it was triggered because of the number of dead bees that were found outside, and the beekeeper noticed that the sizes were dwindling in terms of the cluster and was able to give us a lot of the history of the bees. All right, so honeybees do pick up pesticides from flowers when they're out foraging. Their entire diet is from flowers. They get carbohydrates from nectar and pollen is from protein. And they will find a good location for food and then they will use that information to dance and send cues um, to share so that others can find that same food, which means that they call practicing floral fidelity. So if they're in an orchard where there's lots of that um, food there, then they're not going to go out and constantly be searching for other foods. So if they can find a nice orchard or a nice um, field of canola or a nice field of thistle or something, they're going to preferentially select that. So this is good for the plants because they get pollinated better. 
it's good for the bees because it saves energy, it can be quite damaging if, for example, that field with lots of blossoms is what happened to have just gotten sprayed with the fungicide. So one of the ones we're always concerned about is bees being exposed in direct spray when they're in crop pollination. Um, so here you can see a sprayer going through a blueberry field. There could be bees foraging on the target plant. There could be foraging on the floor. Um, there's issues with native bees potentially. And then the hive itself can actually fan and pull in pesticides into the colony itself. Um, they can also be exposed through plant products, um, especially in systemic treated plants. Um, so here's a corn field and you know, corn is wind pollinated so it doesn't depend on bees. But especially in Michigan, we have places where the bees don't have access to lots of food and they definitely bring in a lot of corn pollen. Um, we also see it in plants in ditches as well. So when we um, have looked at the pesticide levels that are in plants near fields that are systemically treated or use systemic treated seeds, um, you can find that in the plant products of the plants that are nearby in ditches and in the water, they can get exposed through that. And then, because these are foragers, they bring them back to the colony. So this is a photo with bumblebees or a diagram with bumblebees, but the concept is still the same in honeybees. So here you see honeybee foragers, they've got pollen on their legs, and they're going to bring that back into the colony or into the hive. They're going to store the pollen, this is called bee bread, where they take the pollen and they pack it down into the hive or into these cells. And then that's what they're going to eat. The nurse bees are going to eat that. And they're also going to start to feed that to the older larva. So the pollen is very heavily laden with pesticides in a lot of cases, or that's the most likely place, much more than nectar. And they're going to store pollen in, um, in the hive, feed that to the young. And you know some of them do break down, but some of them are persistent. This matrix in which the pollen is being held is a waxy matrix. And so because it's wax, it's lipophilic, and that can also store a lot of food within the colony. So there's plenty, we've done studies at Michigan State looking at um, active ingredients in pollen, and we found many, many, many. Um, there are many studies looking at what active ingredients are found within a, a hive, so in the wax and in the bee bread, and it is, it's actually quite horrifying. Um, so we have the exposure that we're concerned about with the bees of like what actually is sprayed on a forager. And you know, if that's something that is highly toxic to bees, then that bee maybe dies in the field, but the colony is not affected. Whereas if we have these pesticides that are sublethal, and they get brought back to, or they maybe they don't affect an adult bee, but they affect the larva, but they get brought back in the pollen, they're stored within the hive, and they're fed to the larva over time. And that's when we see these effects where the colony perhaps stops thriving. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go quickly over forage and forage quality for health. Um, so bees can get sufficient food from the environment, but only in particular conditions. Um, there must be flowers in bloom. So a lot of times we have beautiful areas in the summer that don't have flowers in bloom. Um, they have to be flowers within the flight range. This is the mimosa plant in Mexico. It's a great nectar plant, but if it's blooming, it does not help my bees in Jackson County, Michigan. And that's the same as if, you know, there's a huge star thistle flow, but I don't have any within three miles of my colony. So it is really that three mile range of where the food is. It must be the right type. You know, here's a beautiful petunia, delightful to look at. It's a hybrid that was raised by humans or designed by humans, so it doesn't actually offer any food to bees. Um, so, and a lot of times we have plants in the ditches that are not, you know, they're fly pollinated or they don't produce nectar. The flowers must not be stressed. So this is white Dutch clover, which produces a lot of nectar, as, but it has a very shallow root. And so if it's dry in the summer, it's not going to take water and turn it into nectar, which flowers only use for reproduction. Um, so same thing with bees, they're not gonna put energy into reproduction. If they themselves are stressed, they're gonna save that water for themselves. So you could see flowers, flowers everywhere, but not a drop of food to drink. The weather must be good for foraging. Um, this is classic Michigan where you'd have lots of things in bloom and it's too rainy for the bees to go out and get it. 
And then the colony must have enough excess bees to forage. So I talked about um, the different tasks that bees will do, but if it's a small colony, or let's say it's a colony, so here this colony actually had a disease and it shrunk down to be very small, this colony would need to be fed. It doesn't have enough bees to go out and forage and also raise the young. Similarly, if it had you know, a pesticide damage, they wouldn't be able to then go out and make a honey crop or to bring in a lot of food. All right, and it is very hard to, to underestimate how much, or it's easy to underestimate how much food a colony needs in order um, to survive through the winter. So it is a lot of food and most places in the environment currently do not provide sufficient clean forage. So I actually stopped mixing up sugar water right now to come give this talk and then that's what I'm going to um, end up doing tomorrow is going out and feeding bees. Um, and a big part of it is there's just few flowers left on the landscape. We've changed the landscape dramatically. Um, we've seen changes in quality. We have monocultures. And a big thing is it's very hard to find actual have clean forage. All right. And so some of them are good for nectar. Some of them are good for pollen. So this is basswood is great for nectar where I am. Queen Anne's lace, they can get a little pollen. Um, but they don't get nectar. And then goldenrod, which we're just finishing up goldenrod right now, they get both from. All right, and the workers do need a lot of stored honey. And the larva, I talked about that huge growth, they need a lot of protein. So those food needs do change over the year, um, depending on whether or not the colony is raising a lot of young or if they're in this winter um, period. All right, so again, going back to this colony in balance, having poor nutrition is one of the things that can really offset this balance. And I'm gonna give you another um, kind of complex slide. Um, oh, in one, in one slide. So I'll walk you through it first a little bit. But if a colony doesn't have sufficient food, then the bees will withhold food from the foragers um, because they're, going, they're old and going to die anyway. Um, the foragers will die off that will cause the nurse bees to become early foragers because they won't be getting that feedback. The nurse bees will then consume eggs and young larvae as a way to retain protein. Then we'll see maybe at that point a dip in the population, which means if you're a beekeeper, you maybe aren't gonna get enough honey. The larvae that survive are gonna be stunted or potentially have risk for more diseases. And they're going to be poor nurse bees themselves because they're going to be um, maybe their hyperpharyngeal glands won't be as good. So they can affect future generations. So here is the diagram I'm talking about. Um, and what you see in the upper left, so this, this black line that we're following is the population of bees. And at the bottom you can see, on the left it is apparently healthy, and on the right it leads to collapse. But you can view this kind of as the body of an animal going through shock or different stages in the shock in that you have these compensatory things and then you also have feedback loops. So let's say we have up here in the upper left hand corner a toxin that causes the bees to become stressed. Um, if you follow across the top, if it's not that big of a deal, you know, like a healthy colony can get rid of things and recover. So if it's an infection, um, bees naturally will fly away and die when they're infected and they'll um, move on. If you have too many bees, then you'll have that decreased ethyl oleate feedback. Um, you'll also have the bees become not able to cover the brood, which will make them be chilled, and then they'll go in this infection loop and get more infection. And then if you have more bees, then you have early foraging, and then you start getting this starvation loop. The, you don't have to, you know, really understand all of this. Again, it's it's more this understanding that the colony has to be in this homeostasis and this balance. But the most important thing is that as a beekeeper, all you might see is that the colony is dwindling. And you may not notice that if you see where dwindling is here, um, way on the right hand side, you don't notice that until the colony has been stressed for weeks. And so a lot of times it's very, very difficult for a beekeeper to understand where the stressor came from or where the original stressor came from because by the time there's anything noticeable, it can be much weeks after. So pesticides may kill a colony outright or they may just affect the foragers offsetting the balance or they may affect just the larva offsetting the balance. 
All right, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about, and it, this slide doesn't even have a conclusion slide, it just ends in like severe depression for you all. So hopefully all the rest of the speakers um, will be able to bring this back into, actually I think we're all talking about death today. Um, but so as beekeepers, we need to evaluate stores of both proteins and carbohydrates. We look for extra frames of honey within the colony. Um, if there's nectar coming in, then we know that they have enough carbohydrates overall. Um, we always make sure that there's, again, excess pollen or bee bread. So one of the things we're always evaluating in terms of nutritional stores is whether or not the bees will have a true excess. So here's a frame of a colony that is well fed. And so we're looking at the sealed brood that looks very healthy. And then we've got this nice ring of pollen and then we've got this nice ring of honey. And then here's a colony that has poor nutrition in that there's not this nice ring of pollen here. And then you can see the larva actually look quite dry. Um, and again, here's one where they've got lots of royal jelly. They're sitting in lots of this high protein, high fat substance. And here is where there's very little. Um, this is something that the beekeeper may evaluate, but they're definitely just looking for what is there. But usually what they're going to see is just this dwindling colony size. Um, so the beekeeper, a lot of times, um, this is my, my last slide, and but a lot of times what they will be noticing is that the colony was out in a field, it seemed to be doing fine. They're, you know, often they're going to be in a holding yard before they go out in the field. So everyone will be fed, everyone will be medicated. They'll go out there in a certain size. Then they bring them off of that pollination contract or they bring them out of that location and then the colonies just start dwindling. And probably what happened in that context is that something much earlier affected that balance and affected um, the bees' ability to come back from that threat. And maybe they will be, but it, this process could take many, many weeks because of how long it takes for an adult bee to emerge from an egg and then how long it takes because before they can go out into a forager. So the main point there is just being that you want to have a colony that is not under all of these threats and all of that stress so that it can maintain their balance and then it can go through that period of natural growth. So that is all that I have for my talks. I don't know if I get three minutes of questions or if we just take a break. Thanks, Megan. Uh, we will collect all the questions and present them during the panel discussion tomorrow. Um, that was a fantastic presentation of bee health. It's hard to believe that was just an overview. Um, really, thank you so much for presenting. So yeah, we're about three minutes ahead of schedule. Um, I don't think it's too much. I think we can go ahead and get started um, on our next presenter and we can possibly take a break later on um, in the webinar. So for now, I'd like to introduce Emily Wine. She is a state apiarist for the Delaware Department of Agriculture. She has a Master of Science in Entomology from Washington State University and has experience working for large-scale beekeeping companies in California. Um, and she will be uh, discussing decl declines from Varroa and other challenges to survival. So I'll hand it over to you, Emily. Thanks. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, for presenting at this webinar. This is a really great lineup of speakers. Um, I do have a little bit of overlap in my talk from what uh, Megan Milbrath did. So I'll go over some of the stuff about um, honeybee life cycle kind of quickly and then get into the pests and diseases. So for starters, when you're working with bees, you're gonna need some basic PPE. You'll need a smoker, which um, you light a uh, fire in, make smoke, and that smoke um, basically acts as a disruptive signal and it prevents bees from sharing their alarm pheromones and it just really calms the bees down. Um, there's also sort of a, a hypothesis that uh, the smoke may mimic a forest fire 
and cause the bees to think they need to pack up and leave their hive. And so they'll start eating honey. And when they're uh, eating, then their abdomens get nice and fat and they're not able to manipulate their abdomens as well to sting you. So they get a little bit fat and lazy uh, when you smoke them. And so it's really uh, an important tool to have with you. You'll need your bee suit. Disposable gloves are really important because you'll be visiting multiple apiaries and you don't wanna spread diseases between apiaries and those thick leather gloves are really hard to sanitize. Hive tools also will need to be sanitized between inspections um, and also between hives if you're seeing signs of diseases in hives and then you'll need your smoker fuel. Um, so for your sampling materials, you're gonna wanna have uh, the materials with you both for pesticide testing and disease testing and that's really important just to have a full picture of what's going on in the colony and to really be able to develop a story of what happened and what caused the colony to, to decline. And so I'm going to start with describing what symptoms of pesticide exposure look like and I'm going to come back to this slide again and again when we see those symptoms with pests and diseases and um, you can begin to see how pesticide exposure can really resemble other issues in colonies. So at the colony level, you'll see piles of dead bees, a sudden decrease in colony population, chilled brood and dead larvae, and the presence of only young fuzzy looking bees. And then at the individual level, you can see paralysis, trembling and disorientation, regurgitation of nectar, so that'll look like wet, sticky bees, and loss of hair from excessive grooming. So first I'm gonna talk about the honeybee life cycle, and, I'll, and, and again, I'll go through that quickly since Megan did a really awesome job on that. Then I'll talk about queen status and quality, then varroa mites and viruses, then insect pests and environmental conditions. So the honeybee life cycle is very similar to the life cycle of a butterfly. They're basically close cousins and they have the same life stages but with different names to them. So the butterfly goes from an egg to a caterpillar to a chrysalis to an adult and a honeybee goes from an egg to a larva to a capped larva to a pupa to an adult. And there are three castes, the female workers and queens and the male drones. And the female workers do all the work within the hive. The queen is the mom of all the bees in the hive and lays all of the eggs. And the drones just exist to mate with the queen and die once they've mated. Um, there's a concept that I call bee math and I find it extremely helpful for developing a timeline to explain what happened in a colony because if you know how long a bee is supposed to spend at a certain life stage, then you can start to see where something went wrong. So say you're in a colony and there's no eggs but there's young larvae, then you know that something happened where the queen stopped laying at least three or four days ago. And so it just helps you to figure out um, when a pesticide spray may have occurred that could have caused damage to a colony or uh, when a colony may have swarmed or basically when it helps you to develop a timeline of what's going on. Oops. Um, and then also, um, to, in terms of developing a timeline, as, as Megan mentioned, 
bees do um, lower risk within hive tasks when they're younger and then higher risk tasks and become foragers when they're older. And so that can also be helpful when assessing a colony because if you're seeing only young fuzzy looking bees uh, and you're not seeing a lot of older foragers which um, tend to have they tend to have fewer hairs on their thorax and even their wings might look a little rattier then uh, you'll know that um, something may have killed out killed off the adult bees if they went foraging in a field uh, where there was a pesticide spray so before we can go in to problems in colonies, you need to know how to recognize what's normal in a colony. Um, so you'll expect to see worker cells, uh, which are these sort of fairly flat but still slightly pillowy cells, and then drone cells, which are larger in diameter and more raised and queen cells which look like peanuts. And again, you may not always see drone cells, presence of drone cells is seasonal and it, the colonies only invest in drones when they have plenty of resources. Other things you'll see are uncapped nectar, which is being in the process of being cured into honey, capped honey, which is can easily be distinguished from brood because it's nice and flat, it's not pillowy at all. And then your chalky, freshly stored pollen and bee bread, which is pollen that has been stored longer term and has had nectar added to it and is shiny. All right, next, I'll talk about queen status and quality. And when we talk about queen quality, we talk about laying pattern. Um, and so queens tend to lay in these nice concentric circles. And when you have a high quality queen, she lays viable eggs and all the, all the eggs survive to be, become larvae. And then those larvae if they're healthy, will survive to become a, become pupae and then adults. And that's when you get that nice solid pattern. And the patchiness and spottiness in a brood pattern comes when cells are either, either non-viable eggs are being laid at the egg stage or um, larvae are be, young larvae are becoming infected with the, with a brood pathogen, or at some stage along the development, it, the cell is failing to develop and undertaker workers are cleaning out those cells. And so that, that spotty laying pattern can be indicative of queen failure and it can also be indicative of disease problems in a colony. And so when you're assessing laying pattern, it's very helpful to look at multiple brood ages and at multiple frames. So in the picture on the left, there's a really nice solid brood pattern with an egg laid in every cell. In the middle, you've got a nice solid brood pattern with young larvae in every cell. And then on the right, that's a spotty pattern because even though there's brood in every cell, the larvae are all and pupae are all different ages, and that means that the queen was going back and backfilling and laying in cells that uh, had failed to develop. And another thing you can expect to see in colonies is is swarm cells. If a colony is planning to swarm or has already swarmed, so. Um, again, swarming is a natural reproductive process where um, about half to two thirds of the colony leaves to find a new home and the remaining bees try to raise a new queen. And 
Um, so these swarm cells are uh, queen cells and the colony typically leaves and forms their swarm within a few days of the swarm cell being capped. So if you see those capped swarm cells, then you have um, a pretty good indication that the colony may have already swarm, swarmed. And if you see emerged queen cells that are empty and the young queens have already come out, then that's a good sign that the colony has already swarmed. And um, so swarming is something to be aware of because the colonies do have such a major loss in population after a swarm that it could lead a beekeeper to think that something was wrong, even though it's a normal reproductive process. Um, and then you uh, may also enco encounter colonies with failing queens and you may see supersedure cells, which can be differentiated from swarm cells because the swarm cells are typically, although not always, at the bottom of the frame, whereas supersedure cells are towards the top or in the middle of a frame. And supersedure cells are just a different way that colonies make queen cells to um, replace a failing queen. And again, spotty brood patterns are very indicative of a failing queen. So once a colony has really been queenless for an extended period of time, so about three weeks or more, you can start getting laying workers. And that's when the uh, the queen is not has not been present and so her pheromones have not been present in the hive to suppress workers ovaries from activating and so young workers can actually develop the ability to lay eggs but they in the absence of a queen but they are not able to go out and mate and so they don't lay fertile eggs they just lay infertile eggs which turn into drones um, and so when you've got a laying worker colony you'll only have drone brood and laying workers don't lay eggs neatly the way queens do queen laid eggs are typically a single egg per cell neatly laid in the bottom of the cell and laying worker eggs are scattershot there can be eggs on the wall of the cell and many eggs per cell um, and it tends to be a very spotty pattern of brood and the brood often also tends to be very poorly tended where laying workers just don't take good care of their brood and you'll see a lot of pretty yucky sick looking brood in a laying worker colony and laying worker colonies are what's known as hopelessly queenless because they are not able to fix themselves in that scenario. It's just a latch, last ditch e effort for the colony to get their genetics out there by producing drones. A drone laying queen um, is something that happens when the queen has run out of sperm to lay fertilized eggs. And so that's another scenario where you'll only have drone brood in the colony. And that's another sort of hopeless situation where the colony is not going to be able to fix itself. And you can distinguish a drone laying queen colony from a laying worker colony because the drone laying queen brood is a more solid brood pattern of drone and tends to be more neatly laid uh, and instead of having multiple eggs per cell it'll be single eggs in the bottom of the cell and i will add that the drone laying queen is much less commonly observed than uh, laying workers it's relatively unusual so just going back to those symptoms of pesticide exposure that I talked about in the beginning, queen failure can lead to a slow dwindling of population. 
and then swarming also results in a rapid decrease in population. Next, I'll talk about varroa mites and viruses. So varroa mites are really a terrible parasite. They are extraordinarily large for a parasite. So if you think about them in relationship to human body, body size, you could basically imagine that you had a chihuahua attached to you and feeding on you. And not only is it a chihuahua-sized parasite, it's a rabid chihuahua because these varroa mites are spreading viruses. And so that this is a picture of me with a uh, varroa mite scaled to human size for comparison. And varroa mites feed on all stages of the bees. They feed on the larvae, the pupae, and the adult honeybees. They leave open wounds on the bee's body that make them susceptible to infection, and they also transmit viruses. Um, and varroa mites consume fat body, which is an organ that is essential for energy storage, hormone de detoxification, immune response, and pesticide detoxification. And so varroa mites really are the number one threat to honeybee colonies. And so varroa are transmitted to developing brood cells by nurse bees who are taking care of the brood. The mites reproduce on the developing brood and then um, in terms of transmission between colonies, a lot of that happens in robbing behavior and drifting, uh, which is, uh, I'll talk about robbing behavior a bit later on, but drifting is bees getting disoriented and, and drifting between colonies. And so the alcohol wash method is a great method for checking for varroa mites and it can be done on live or dead colonies. And so you'll need to find a brood frame and make sure that the queen isn't on it if it's a live colony. And it's important that you use a brood frame because if you use a frame of, say, honey, then the bees that are on that frame will be older and have more developed flight muscles and when you try to shake bees off that frame, they'll just fly away. So you'll need to use a brood frame. And then you'll shake bees into a bin, tap them into a corner, and scoop half a cup of bees. It sounds silly, but there's 300, roughly 300 bees in a half a cup, and that really allows you to quantify your percent infestation. So you'll then place the bees in an alcohol wash container and cover with alcohol by about an inch, shake for a minute, and allow mites to settle and count. And then you'll do the math. So again, if you're counting mites out of 300, then to get your percent infestation out of 100, all you'll have to do is divide by three. So say you had 12 mites and 300 bees, you would have four mites in 100 bees, which is a 4% infestation. And there is a video de demonstration on how to do an alcohol wash at de.gov slash honeybees. So you'll need to interpret your mite count results. And it's important to think about the seasonality of when bee population builds up and and the related mite population increase. And there is a slight lag between when the bee population peaks and then when the mite population peaks. So throughout the season, in spring into summer, the bee population is growing, 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 growing so fast that the uh, mite population isn't doesn't appear as high relative to the population of bees but then in the fall the bees enter a broodless period when all the mites have hatched out of the brood and the bee population is no longer growing and that's when you really all of a sudden will get high levels of mites 
and so in it, it's going to vary based on where you are in the country but uh here in in delaware in the middle of the summer your mites may be fairly low and then come september and october you'll start really seeing high numbers and then so for in, interpreting your mite counts um counts uh, the treatment thresholds tend to be between one and three percent but you really start seeing colonies acutely crashing from mites at numbers probably greater than 10 or 15 or even higher uh, percent infestation. Um, so for symptoms of varroa infestation, you'll often see deformed wing virus, which is a virus that's spread by varroa mites. And so you'll just see bees that are missing wings almost entirely, or you can see partially crumpled wings. Um, and then another symptom is what's called parasitic mite syndrome or snotty brood. And it's not, it's not a well understood disorder, but it's uh, likely a cocktail of viruses or other stresses that um, happen when there's a high level of mites that cause sort of slumped, yucky looking, snotty, uncapped larvae. And so it can be really helpful to have toothpicks with you in the field because I'll like to pick in to those yucky brood cells and often I'll just be pulling mites out of cells with the brood. There are many diseases associated with varroa mites um, and since the varroa mites cause a lot of stress in the colony many diseases that are not actively spread by varroa mites but are but that are stress related disorders can be exacerbated and so one example is european fowl brood bacterial infections and then many viruses, including deformed wing virus, acute bee paralysis virus, cashmere bee virus, and Israeli acute paralysis virus. And the paralysis viruses, um, which is this picture on the top right, often have bees that are black and shiny and um, are very disoriented and trembling and pretty much almost indistinguishable from a pesticide affected bee. And so that's definitely a case where it's important to get virus testing done to figure out what's going on with the colony. And then again, another picture of deformed wing virus here. And there are many viruses associated with honeybees, uh, not all of which are necessarily spread by varroa mites. Um, so there are more than 20 viruses that have been identified in honeybees. And as I mentioned, paralysis virus symptoms strongly resemble pesticide exposure. This photo on the right is another picture um, that of of paralysis virus symptoms, and those symptoms are very variable. So this bee you can see has a uh, stunted abdomen. The abdomen doesn't extend much past the back legs, whereas this normal looking bee has a much longer abdomen. So if you're looking at piles of dead bees or even looking at live bees, you may wanna look for signs of stunting. Um, and then, um, Again, the, the bees turn black and shiny um, with the paralysis viruses. So for disease testing, uh, you can send samples to the National Agricultural Genotyping Center in Fargo, North Dakota, and they take samples of all stages of bees, including dead and dying adult bees and larvae and pupae. And they do have a full honeybee pathogen panel 
that covers a wide swath of different diseases and really covers your bases as far as figuring out what's going on. And then they have other suites of testing as well that might fit your needs. And so again, with the, um, especially with, with viruses like the paralysis viruses, you can really see piles of dead bees and sudden decreases in colony population. Um, however, with gen generally with uh, varroa mite infestations, you will see a slow dwindling in colony population. And then um, you'll see dead larvae with the parasitic mite syndrome, and then paralysis, trembling, and disorientation is a symptom of the, of the paralysis viruses, as well as loss of hair from excessive grooming with the paralysis viruses. All right, next I'm going to talk about some insect pests. Um, so wax moths are primarily a pest of stored comb. A strong honeybee colony will defend itself from invaders and, and should not succumb to wax moths. So typically when you're seeing a really nasty wax moth infestation where it's just the colony is just crawling with larvae and you're seeing cocoons and wax moths flying around at that stage the colony has probably been in decline for a, an extended period of time so um if you are doing an inspection and the beekeeper says uh, they just sprayed pesticides yesterday and my colony is dead and then you co you open it up and it's full of wax moths then the colony has probably actually been dead or dying for quite some time and it's really the same scenario with the small hive beetle where hi small hive beetles can be present in colonies in pretty substantial quantities, uh, even in a strong colony, but they usually don't reach the point of doing a ton of damage until the colony is dead or seriously in decline. And small hive beetles will do something called sliming the, the hive, which is really nasty, and they basically will feed on the honey and they'll ferment it and it will become a slimy smelly mess um, and the hive beetles are very difficult for the bees to attack because you can see the way their body is they're like little turtles and they can compress in their limbs and their antennae and are pretty much indestructible um, so but but you, you so you may see the adults running around because the bees can't really um, attack them very well, but it it won't get to this nasty uh, larvae filled stage until the hive is has been in decline for some time. So that is also an indication of the timing of the problem. And hive beetles are more problematic in warm, wet regions such as the southeast. They're worse in shady apiaries, and again, most problematic in weak colonies or stored comb. Argentine ants are um, most are very regionally located. Um, they're mostly a problem in the southeast and the southwest, and they feed on honeybee brood um, and they'll carry carry the brood back to their nest and they um, are can be difficult for a colony to deal with and they're they commonly will cause absconding um, and so absconding is just what happens when the colony has just decided it is not gonna continue living where it, where it is and it's just going to get up and go and find somewhere else to live and it's differentiated from swarming because with swarming about half of the bees will remain behind whereas with absconding the bees just leave 
And I'm put. I, I'm mentioning it under Ar Argentine ants because they're sort of noted for causing that issue. But really, any severe infestation of any pest can cause that absconding behavior. And then robbing behavior is really important because it can be a major source of disease transmission and pest transmission between colonies. It occurs during dearth periods because it's a very high risk behavior where if bees could just go out and sip nectar from flowers, they would do that rather than fighting with another colony. So if there's very little resources out in the landscape, they'll engage in robbing. Um, and that robbing can be from other honeybee colonies attacking each other, and it can also be wasps um, or and hornets attacking bee colonies. And often you get these weak colonies that are susceptible from, from robbing from much stronger colonies. And those weak colonies may be weak because they have high levels of pests and diseases. And the robbers from the stronger colonies will come in and bring those pests and diseases back with them. Um, and you can observe robbing behavior by seeing bees fighting at the entrance, um, pile, you can see piles of dead bees, and you'll often see really frenzied activity where bees are trying to get in from every single corner of the hive, even if it's not a real entrance, and they're sort of hovering and just finding some way to get in. There is a video available uh, that gives you a really good depiction of robbing behavior at de.gov slash honeybees. So um, for robbing behavior, you really can get those huge piles of dead bees if it's severe enough and the bees are really fighting each other. And you can get a sudden decrease in colony population, especially with absconding where the colony up and leaves, but you can also see it if there is severe enough robbing. All right, lastly, I'm gonna talk about environmental conditions. Um, so if you're observing a colony that's in the process of starving, um, Megan did a really good job of showing the really dry looking brood cells. Um, if it's even past, past that stage in, sever in severity, the starving bees will be lethargic and moving really slowly. And then once the colony has died, um, the bees will typically die face first in the cells, and there may be a large, a large pile of dead bees on the bottom board. And so that dying with their face, face first in the colony is partly because they're trying to stick their heads in and eat any remaining nectar in the cells, and it's also just them huddling for warmth. Um, and in a colony that's starved to death, you'll see little capped honey or nectar and the boxes will be really lightweight. There is an exception that if there's uh, a lot of cold weather, sometimes bees can starve in the midst of a fair amount of honey in the hive because they'll have trouble moving their cluster and get finding their way to honey within the hive. Um, and then, it's especially in periods of temperature fl fluctuations, you may uh, observe chill chilled brood, and that happens when the bee colony is not large enough to maintain temperature of the entire brood nest. And um, the uncapped larvae will appear discolored, and capped larvae will be chewed up because this these pupae are. Um, are, are dead and the bees are cleaning them out. And some of the brood may be perfectly healthy because the cluster of bees in the nest will cluster around as much of the brood as it can keep warm. So you'll have dead brood in the midst of perfectly healthy brood a lot of the time. And it can be a result of beekeeper mismanagement if Beekeepers made splits and they weren't strong enough to keep up all the brood warm once they split them, or it um, often is observed with major weather fluctuations. 
I did actually see some a colony with chilled brood on in really warm uh, 80 degree weather in August and that was because the lid blew off in a major thunderstorm and the colony got rained on. So you can really observe it almost any time of year. And lastly, beekeeper mismanagement is a factor because um, beekeepers may neglect to treat for mites or requeen colonies or feed their colonies, um, leading to failure of the colony. And then there's also misuse of miticides because many miticides have optimal temperature ranges and ventilation requirements and uh, misuse can cause queen failure, dead brood, and large numbers of dead adult bees. So again, with, um, with those environmental conditions or beekeeper mismanagement, you can also see the piles of dead bees, sudden decrease in colony population, and chilled brood and dead larvae. So I'm just going to put it all together with one bee kill case study. I know you're going to hear a lot more later on. So um, last year, I responded to a bee kill call with Jimmy Hughes in our pesticide section. And it really is helpful if, if um, a pesticide inspector and an apiarist can go out together and really sort of build a full picture of what's going on. And so what the beekeeper had reported were piles of dead bees in front of the hive and lethargic crawling bees that were unable to fly. Um, with our observations, we saw that there were three colonies. This is a picture of the apiary with one dead and two very, very weak. Um, there was just a small amount of dead bees at the entrance, and that's because the beekeeper had cleaned it up before we got there, which happens way more often than you'd think, and it's really frustrating. So make sure to really strongly emphasize that the beekeeper needs to leave everything as is and not clean it up before you get there. Um, we also saw a lot of bees with deformed wing virus and the boxes really were feather light. There was no feed, food in them. So what, um, looking back at the, the sort of landscape um, leading up to the event, there'd been four days of cool and rainy weather that preceded the bee kill report. And so there was not a lot of opportunity for the bees to forage and come in contact with pesticides. And with how light on food they were, it seemed that the bees had eaten through all their stored honey. And the, the, on top of that, the mite counts were very high with um, counts of 35% and 44%. And we took pesticide samples and no pesticides were detected on the sample of adult bees. Um, and so our determination was that the cause of death was a combination of starvation, varroa mites, and viruses. All right, here's some references um, for uh, some useful sites. And then you're welcome to uh, contact me directly with questions and comments. And that's all. Thank you so much, Emily. Presentation was very informative on all the different challenges that bees face and also how to spot indicators to determine what's actually happening in the hive. And I really liked your analogy of a uh, varroa mites being rabid chihuahuas. So it is 1.23 and our next presentation is not until 1.30 and about, we're about halfway through our first day. So I think it's a good time to pause for a few minutes um, and maybe circle back at 1.30 to hear from Gina on EPA registered by pesticide products for use in hives.
So we've been keeping an eye on the questions in the question box, and we saw the one pertaining to um, a copy of the presentation materials. As a reminder, if you click on the handout section at the bottom near the chat bar, uh, you'll find today's PowerPoint presentation as well as the agenda and EPA bee kill inspection guidance. All right, and now I think we can move on to introducing our next speaker. Gina Burnett is joining us as a senior regulatory advisor in EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs. She joined the agency in 2009, and Gina's areas of expertise include biochemical pesticide product registration and FIFRA 25B minimum risk exemption criteria. And I'll pass it on to you, Gina. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think um, I think we're ready to go. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I I do work um, at EPA. I am in the biopesticide division. Um, I am at EPA headquarters in Washington D.C. And what I really spend most of my time doing is um, helping pesticide companies understand our registration process and uh, reviewing those registration applications for new pesticide products. Uh, bee products are a very small um, portion of what we review, but we do have quite a few of them in the biopesticide division. So um, I want to use this time to quickly walk through the biopesticide products uh, for use against varroa mites in the hive and just give you guys um, a little bit of familiarity with those active ingredients. So uh, for those um, who aren't aware, um, we'll go through what are biopesticides. So um, they are different than conventional pesticides. Um, Biopesticides are defined as naturally occurring substances, uh, which we call those actually biochemicals. And those are um, naturally occurring and usually have a non-toxic mode of action to the target pest. Uh, we also have microorganisms that control pests, which is our microbial pesticide group. And we have the pesticidal substances that are produced by plants because of added genetic material. And those are the plant incorporated protectants or PIPs. And finally, we have a new area um, of emerging pesticidal technologies. It contains many different exciting things, but one of them you may have heard of recently is our genetically engineered mosquito products that were registered a couple years ago. So as far as varroa mites in the hive, we currently have eight biopesticide products that have been, um, that are actively approved. Um, one thing to note, and I'll go to that list of products on the next slide, but um, one interesting thing to note is that the, um, I wanna go one more slide ahead. Um, <laughs> just because we have this, you know, list of products on our website doesn't mean these things are actually in the marketplace. That's kind of the tricky thing is we are in the business of approving products when companies bring them forward to us, but we really don't have much of a sense of what then is actually being sold and being used. So um, apologies if I mention things that are just very irrelevant or that aren't even um, being used, but this is what I know. Um, this is a list from our website. Um, the link was on the slide right before this, but you can get to it by Googling EPA registered pesticide products for Varroa. This should be one of the first things that come up. Um, so we have this table and the first column is the EPA registration number. Um, for those that aren't familiar, that's a unique identifier that's given to each product that EPA approves. In the second column, we have the product's name, the product name, and um, it's a little tricky because oftentimes there are alternate brand names that are used. So you may see two or three products on the shelf. Um, <laughs> they have different names, so you think they're different products. But if you look in the fine print, 
all three may have the same EPA registration number. So um, that's just something to keep in mind that the EPA registration number is the clear identifier as to what pesticide product we're talking about, not necessarily the product name. Um, because with that, we have these um, what are called distributor products. So if you look at the bottom of the left-hand column, there, some products have three numbers. So there's you know, two dashes in there. Those are people who are distributing the original product. And oftentimes when you distribute the product, you change the name too. So um, that just makes it even a little bit more tricky. But um, uh, on the final, the right-hand column, we have the active ingredient name. Uh, this list on the website contains the conventional products and the biopesticide products. So I went ahead and put a little blue star next to all of my products, as I call them, my biopesticides. And then Chrissy will come on after me and talk about the ones that are not starred because those are the conventionals. And I, I really appreciate um, her doing that for me because I'm not familiar with them. So um, I will walk you through um, the starred products here um, and just sort of give you an overview of how they might be being used in the hive. I keep moving my cursor, so. <laughs> All right, so the first product is probably known as AppGuard. Um, that's the, the approved brand name that we see and um, it comes in two forms. The picture here is the um, form of a aluminum tray. It contains a papery pre-wetted pad. We call it a cellulose pad. And it's pre-wetted with the pesticide formulation, which is probably um, mostly thymol and contains a gel that helps it sort of um, vaporize slowly. Uh, there are some restrictions on the label. Uh, these are pretty common restrictions. It talks about using the product only within certain temperatures. So it um, states that you should not use the product when the maximum daily temperature is lower than 60 degrees Fahrenheit or when the colony activity is very low and that you should not use it when the temperature is above 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, also um, states that you should ensure that worker bees can access this tray. So something about the workers coming in contact with the thymol is important. And um, um, each label, of course, gives dosage um, amounts. And it, this one in particular talks about using treatments at different temperatures. And I'll, the next slide is also the same product. So um, just continuing this conversation. So this is a, just another way that AppGuard is sold. Here, you have a bucket of gel, you have a syringe, and then you have some sort of um, dosing tray that you would put it on. So um, uh, this label states that, you know, you're going to draw up into the syringe and apply it to the tray and place that into the hive. Um, some additional statements on the label uh, indicate that you should not treat during honey flow, that you should um, leave the product in there until the tray is empty, but then remove the product uh, when you're installing supers on the colony. Um, so uh, also remove surplus honey supers before applying the treatment. And then this one does have a re-entry interval of 48 hours. The next group of products uses the active ingredient formic acid. For formic acid, we currently see three EPA registrations. The first one I could not find online. It's known as Formite. So I suspect that one is not being sold or distributed in the US right now. Um, the second um, and third are by the same company that's that 75710-2 and-3. Those are known as Mitaway Crick Strips and Formic Pro, which is just another version of the strips. So um, what I um, gleaned from those labels is that the um, the two products, the Formic Pro and the Quick Strips, have a difference in shelf life and um, also in treatment periods. So um, someone using this product would want to pay attention to how often to treat. Um, so you you know, I you know sometimes you buy one product and then you'll switch it out for another and you won't need, read the label and, and that is a problem. So so that's something to highlight here. Um, those are listed. 
the next active ingredient is a little bit newer. Um, we approved a product called Hot Beta Acids. Um, the brand names that we see, and this has changed a little bit, but uh, HopGuard 2 appears to still be out there and HopGuard 3, it is the same formulation. And these are the little strips, the, the black strips that you see in the photo. Um, they are to be placed in the brew chamber, not in the honey super. They are to be applied one strip per five frames and spaced evenly. You are to unfold the strip and hang them over the top bars of brood frames. Leave the strip in the hive for 14 days and no later than 30. So it should be removed after 30 days using up to four times per year. The next product is um, one that we get a lot of questions about. This is oxalic acid. So the EPA registered product is gonna have this label on the front of it. Um, it's called oxalic acid dihydrate, and it has a skull and crossbones on it because it can be toxic to humans. So there is a lot of um, warning language on there um, when um, it's applied. There's some precautionary um, PPE that needs to be worn. So um, for, for this particular product, there's two ways to apply it. It's applied either as a solution when mixed with sugar water, or it's applied through a vaporizer apparatus. So you, through the bottom of the entrance and all entr other entrances must be sealed. So um, the label indicates that this product can be used when little or no brood is present because it will not control the varroa mites in capped brood and may be damaging to the bee brood. Um, another product that we uh, think is out there is a mixture of three ingredients. It's thymol, oil of eucalyptus, and menthol. This also appears as a, a pad that's impregnated with the formulation. This product is called AP Life Var. And uh, restrictions on this product include, do not use when honey supers are in place to prevent excessive residues in the marketable honey or wax by unwanted residues. And use when the daytime highs are between 64 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not apply the treatment when bees are robbing. The, uh, I love that one. The last um, active ingredient that biopesticides registered um, is sucrose octanoate. Um, we were really excited about that one because we hadn't had a new B active, a veromite active ingredient in a while, but when I search online, I do not see it anywhere. So I suspect that sucrose octanoic products are not being used in hives currently, um, but, but who knows? Maybe they're just not being sold online. So this one um, indicates that you should have a thorough spray coverage of the adult honeybees on the frame for good control of the pest, which is the mite, and that you should remove the frames with adhering bees and spray both sides or leave the frames in place and apply this product to the frame spaces. The restrictions include do not apply this product through any type of feeding or watering system, repeat the applications up to three times per infestation, and also um, for Prior to the, your application, you should calculate the number of seconds needed to deliver the proper dosage. So again, you're spraying this, so you wanna get a certain amount of spray onto the frames. So using whatever you're gonna spray with, with the guidance is you know, do a test spray into a measured container so that you know that you are delivering between one and a half fluid ounces to three ounces of spray. And finally, do not apply this product when honeybees are in winter cluster or at temperatures below 55 degrees Fahrenheit to avoid chilling the bee population. So um, I, think, I think my next slide just says questions and we don't need that now. Um, but before I pass it over to Chrissy um, to talk about the conventional pesticides, I just wanted to, to mention that you know, all these products that I'm showing today are EPA registered. You can, um, you know, find them out there for the most part. But we do suspect, um, and we do hear that a lot of beekeepers like to use these active ingredients outside of an EPA registered product situation. And so um, 
we suspect that a lot of beekeepers buy these active ingredients, which some of them are commodity chemicals that you could buy at a hardware store or order online, um, and use them in in a manner that they think is appropriate in their hive. And in that case, you know, they wouldn't have an EPA <laughs> registered label to look at dosing and restrictions. So um, it is concerning to us. Um, we are worried about the hives um, when things are used without an EPA approved um, label with directions for use on them. So um, I think just want to note that you know, if, if you're going to inspect and, you know, someone says they're using thymol or they're using formic acid or, or oxalic acid, um, are they using the EPA registered product that contains formic acid or did they buy formic acid and apply it in some way um, that they thought would, would be fit for their hive? So that was just my little plug for using registered products. Um, and so now I think um, we can go on to Chrissy. Thanks, Gina, for your presentation. Yeah, I agree. I think having a better understanding on the in-hive pesticide products can be really helpful for state inspectors to determine if the pesticides are being properly used by the beekeepers. So next, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Chrissy Mogren. She's the brainchild behind this webinar and the regional sub lead for pollinator protection. She's a regional project officer in the pesticide section in EPA region six. And she's been with the agency since 2021. She's been an assistant professor of pollinator ecology prior to joining EPA. She received a undergraduate degree, degree from Santa Clara University and a PhD from the University of California, Riverside. And with that, I will pass it over to Chrissy to talk on EPA registered conventional products for use in hives. Thanks. Great, right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so as was mentioned, I am based out of EPA's regional office in, that's located in Dallas, Texas. And today we'll be speaking about um, the EPA registered conventional products that may be found um, being used inside of um, honeybee colonies. So this is going back to the list that was presented um, by Gina in her presentation on the biopesticides. So just highlighting here the ones that I'll be talking about specifically. So we've got the apistan strips, which again are used um, to target uh, Varroa inside of colonies. We've got apivar, which is amitraz based product, uh, again for Varroa control. We've got Checkmite Plus beehive control strip, strips, which is Kumafos. And this one is actually labeled for use against the small hive beetle as well as Varroa mites. So we'll go into a little bit of detail about um, the application differences between the two. And then finally, um, speak about a product. It's another Amitraz based product called Amiflex that was uh, just registered by the EPA earlier this year. So go into a little bit more detail about that one. So as was the case for many of the biopesticides, these conventional pesticides are, are maybe applied by strips. Now, when you're going into an apiary and going into um, you know, a situation where you're speaking with beekeepers about potential losses, it's always a great idea to ask them, you know, what products are you using inside their colony? Because as was mentioned in the first two presentations, there's a lot of things aside from pesticides that can be impacting colonies. Um, in addition to pesticides, and oftentimes they can have similar symptoms to pesticides themselves. And so, you know, ensuring that the beekeeper is using these and then also using them properly when you're reviewing um, labels will be really important. Um, so uh, for these conventional pesticides, all three that I mentioned, Apivar, Apistan, as well as Checkmite Plus, um, as was the case with some of our biopesticides, the honey supers must be removed. So none of these may be applied to boxes that are containing honey that is intended for human consumption. In the case of Apivar, um, the beekeeper must actually wait for 14 days after the strips have been removed before replacing the honey supers. And then, you know, just a reminder too, these are being placed inside of the brood chambers. So that's what was being talked about where we've got these lovely frames that are full of pearly white, um, you know, larvae, that's where these are intended to be used. Um, in the case of apistan, 
do not replace the honey supers until the product has been removed. So we don't have a hold period, but it must be removed before the supers may be replaced. And then do not treat any um, beeswax that is intended for human consumption. So sometimes beekeepers um, may harvest um, comb that is full of honey for human consumption. So if that has been treated with apistan, uh, that may not be used for that marketing purpose. And then finally for Check My Plus, the honey supers can be replaced as soon as the strips are placed in the brood boxes. So while we need, um, you know, the brood boxes themselves are gonna be treated with um, these strips that are uh, treated with the Kumafos and the Check My Plus, it's okay to put the honey supers back on top while the treatment is in effect, so long as the strips are not themselves in the honey boxes. Uh, now these products, um, as was mentioned by Gina, as well for some of the biopesticides, are going to be most effective when they have been applied in the spring and the fall. And this is because these are the time periods, um, as was you know demonstrated in earlier slides, when the brood numbers themselves are going to be pretty low. So the bees have just come out of winter and they're starting to build up their populations to collect um, and store honey. Or in the fall, when we kind of stop producing brood because we're getting ready to go into our our winter clusters. And so the, you know, the brood that are being produced are declining so that we'll just have the adult bees that'll um, for the purpose of overwintering. Um, so the reason why it's best to treat during these times is that the varroa mites are feeding on the brood themselves. That's how the varroa are you're feeding, but then also reproducing. And so when we have lower brood numbers, the reproductive rate of the varroa mite are gonna be lower. And that's why you wanna target those periods of time for treatments. Um, this is also going to coincide with times before the honey flow, hopefully, um, if you've got a you know, cooperative weather and a co cooperative environment, and then also after the major honey flow. Um, now, in the case of Apivar, this is a product that actually needs to be removed two weeks before a honey flow starts. So, you know, based on weather forecasts or also just, you know, when plants have bloomed in the past, beekeepers are able to um, you know, kind of guesstimate when that is, when that'll occur. So that is, you know, something to keep in mind, those need to be removed um, two weeks before they have honey supers on and start collecting honey um, that they plan on um, selling. Um, now with regards to the application rate for Varroa mite control, it's actually gonna be the same for all of these products. So what we're doing is um, adding one strip per five frames of brood. So um, Megan talked in her presentation about the, the Langstroth hive setup. So that's gonna be kind of this image here on the left. We've got a box and then this is gonna have, you know, it's equivalent of 10 frames. So if you're dealing with a brood box that's maybe only half full, um, so for five, you know, five frames of brood, um, then you'll do one strip. If this is, you know, full, all 10 are full of brood, you have a very productive colony, then you may use two strips. And this is not to exceed four strips per colony. So sometimes you have a very large, very productive colony and you have two brood boxes that may be treated at once. But, you know, again, as is mentioned on all of these labels, it's gonna be most effective when brood numbers are low. Uh, but you may use up to four strips per colony. And it's also recommended that all colonies in the apiary be treated. So you check for your mite numbers to see are you at your critical treatment threshold. If you are, then you should treat all of them because again, as was mentioned, honeybees can be opportunistic and rob weakened colonies. So if you're treating everybody, um, potential varroa then are not being introduced by um, robbing colonies if you're dealing with smaller or potentially weaker colonies. Now with regards to the length of the application, um, there are for the most part, these are about the same. So both both Apivar and Apistan um, should be kept in the brood chamber for 42 days, but not to exceed 56 days. Um, for Apivar, um, this is not to exceed two applications per year. So this may only be done twice. So again, most effective spring and fall. And Apistan is gonna work best, again, during this, you know, these two times of year when your daytime highs are greater than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're going to need to be treating at a time of year, you know, when we're either warming up or cooling down. Um, and in the case of Check My uh, Plus, it's a, a little bit of a shorter um, application window and the strips should be left inside of the colonies for 42 to 45 days. Um, so as I mentioned, Check My Plus, which is a Kumafos based product, can also be used to treat small hive beetles. Um, you will, what a beekeeper can do, again, so in the case of this product, 
Um, it's not to be applied to boxes that are containing honey, but you may, be, you may treat, um, you know, while you have a honey flow on, that those boxes can, the honey boxes may not be the boxes that are themselves treated. So in this case, what a beekeeper can do, and this is per, per the label, is cut out a four inch squared piece of corrugated cardboard and then remove the paper on one side. And that's kind of what I'm trying to demonstrate here in this picture on the right. So we've got you know, a piece of cardboard and we tore off the top so you can see the corrugation here. Um, what you can do is then cut this, you know, kind of a, a plastic based product, cut that in half crossways and then staple that to the corrugated side of the cardboard. Um, now the smooth side of the cardboard, you're gonna wanna tape over um, with duct tape because you know the honeybees are going to be like what's this cardboard doing in here and they'll they'll kind of chew it up and then and then remove it so the duct tape will kind of help slow that process down or, or um, stop the bees from doing that and then this will be placed on the bottom board of the colony so this is going to be below the brood chamber and the idea behind this application method is that these small hive beetles with their little turtle body shape are going to crawl into the corrugated cardboard because honeybees may be harassing them because they obviously don't want them in the colony. So they'll kind of slip within these corrugated cracks and try and hide underneath these pesticide strips and that's when they will contact the pesticide. Um, and as is the case for um, control of varroa mites, these may be left in for 42 but not to exceed 45 days for maximum control of the small hive beetles. So if you see some alternative use of a strip inside of a colony, um, check with the beekeeper because it may they may be doing this for small hive beetle control. Um, and so to um, conclude this section on the conventional products, um, we have um, this no, uh, new pesticide that was just registered by the EPA earlier this year. Um, that's an amitraz-based product um, called Amiflex. I want to point out that this is a restricted use pesticide. So while it's now uh, registered for use in, I think all, it's getting close to all 50 states. So I, I, I say that, you know, currently registered for use in 39 states plus the District of Columbia. I think that may have increased by now. Um, the product itself may not yet be on the market, but it's just something to keep in mind that if a beekeeper is using this product to double check that they have um, a license to be uh, using restricted use pesticides. Um, so this, the application method in this case is a gel. Um, and that's because this has been formulated for use as a flash treatment. So again, we're removing our honey supers and they should not be replaced until this product has been removed. Um, colonies may be treated in the spring, uh, summer, as well as fall. So, you know, it's in, not to exceed four treatments per year. So this can be used when brood numbers are a bit higher. And it actually is not gonna be as effective on sparsely populated and um, inactive colonies. So the reason for this, it's kind of the last bullet point on the slide, is that this can be used seven days before a longer acting treatment to achieve a knockdown effect. So it's not something that'll necessarily, that's not necessarily registered um, to, you know, knock back all varroa numbers during, you know, the summer when you may be, you know, uh, coming to a point of time where you're reaching peak varroa numbers, but it'll knock them down so that it can be followed up with another product, for example, one of the, the biopesticide products. So um, don't be concerned um, if a beekeeper is using multiple products back to back because um, they may be labeled for that use and that is okay. Um, and when used properly, they should not be having an adverse reaction to the colonies necessarily. But again, double check the label. So in this case, it's a gel-based application method. So um, the way that the product is uh, it's intended to be marketed, it'll be easy enough for beekeepers to measure this out, but you're dosing with one line of three mils, milliliters of the product per five frames of bees, not to exceed 12 milliliters for colony. So it's very similar to the strips. So you've got three milliliters per five frames. Um, you do two strips if you're dealing with a 10 frames in a brood box, not to exceed 12 mils. So that would be the equivalent of four strips inside your colony. Um, any excess products should be removed after seven days. Um, and a second application may be made um, seven days after removing the previous application, but again, not to exceed four applications per year. Um, so if you, uh, that's my uh, final slide with regards to conventional products that are available for use inside of colonies. And um, just a reminder that if you have any questions on these um, uh, pesticides that may be used inside of colonies, um, you know, feel free to add them into the questions portion 
um, of the webinar platform, and these will be um, answered tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chrissy. Yeah, so again, I think it's really helpful for uh, pesticide inspectors to have a better understanding of the co commonly used pesticide products and how they're used correctly. So now I'd like to introduce our next two speakers who will be presenting on interpreting hive declines during inspections that are not pesticide related. Dr. Ramesh Sagili is a professor in the Department of Horticulture at Oregon State University. He is a PhD in entomology from Texas A&M University, specializing in honeybee research. He initiated the creation of the Oregon Master Beekeeper Program and chaired the Oregon Governor's Task Force on Pollinator Health. He received several awards, including the Entomological Society of America Pacific Branch Research Award, Eastern Apicultural Society's Outstanding Research Award, and OSU Outreach and Engagement Award. And our next speaker uh, is Carolyn Brees. She's been a research assistant for the Oregon State University Honeybee Lab since 2009. She maintains the OSU apiary of 60 to 80 colonies, provides research support, teaches online beekeeping classes for OSU students, and provides educational workshops and events for Oregon beekeepers. And from 2009 to 2016, she coordinated the Oregon Master Beekeeper Program. She has a BS in biology from University of Oregon and a MS in forestry from Northern Arizona University. And with that, I will pass it over to them. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about interpreting hive declines unrelated to pesticides. Uh, pesticide kills have so much complexity, and on top of that, we have what's going on with bees. So, um, so this is a good opportunity to talk things through. I will go through what's normal colony losses and what, um, what are some um, problems with colonies that are not related to pesticides. And then Dr. Ramesh Sagili, uh, the professor of the OSU Honey Bee Lab, will follow up with um, some videos of pesticides, um, pesticide incidences and, um, and what's normal and what's not. So um, first I want to talk about getting the phone call from your beekeeper about a pesticide incident. First, consider your beekeeper. There are two groups of beekeepers in general, and of course there's some overlap, but we have the hobbyist or backyard beekeepers with maybe um, one to a few colonies in the backyard. They um, they care very much. They, these, they have an emotional connection to those colonies and they visit them all the all the time. They are generally more inexperienced than commercial beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers are the ones with thousands of colonies that drive them on trucks from pollination event to pollination event. And they have a lot more experience and they have the experience in an agricultural setting. So they may, these two groups may have a different perspective. Um, both will be distressed and um, it is a it's an alarming situation to open a colony and and see a bunch of dead bees or see a bunch of dead bees in the front of your colony so have some empathy when you talk to your beekeeper uh, listen very carefully to anything that they can give you um, in terms of what happened so gather all of the information these are a few questions that i like to ask right out of the gate um, later in this workshop, there will be um, a presenter with a much more formal and refined set of questions, but I like to ask these to rule out anything that may have happened to the colony before we get to the pesticides. So when did you last check the bees? Were they, was this winter? Did you check them months ago or was it a week ago? Was the colony, usually the answer um, about the colony condition was that they were very robust, big, large colonies. And suddenly they're very surprised to see this collapse. And this is common because when, with starvation, with varroa mites and pesticides, the crashes can be pretty, pretty quick. 
um, I asked what the last mite count was and what they did for mite treatment. And um, I want to know if the beekeeper understands the seriousness of Varroa. Do they have an active mite management plan? And, um, and again, I'm just trying to rule out Varroa mites for the reason for the colony crash. And any other history? Did they feed them recently? What did they feed them with? Were they re-cleaned? Did they swarm? Um, what time of year is it? Is there, is there any other information the beekeeper can give you to be able to put these puzzle pieces together and really understand what happened? I think it's important to describe the testing procedure to the beekeeper, let them know how the samples will be taken, um, what they do with the results. Um, the, what you do with the results can be a sensitive subject, especially if you have a grower with a long-standing relationship with the beekeeper. The, uh, the beekeeper understands that the grower has a, a crop that they need to protect, and the beekeeper has bees they need to protect. And so there may be a situation where they could come together and, and work something out. Or if it is the beekeeper's call, maybe um, they can decide how they want to proceed once they know this procedure um, in order to protect a sensitive relationship. So now let's talk about dead bees. Um, I'll be mostly talking about dead adult bees. Um, so we have starvation, mite infestation. These are the top two reasons why you might find a, a bunch of dead bees other than pesticides. And then uh, queenlessness, dead drones in front of the hive, drone brood laying workers. Diseases I won't talk about too much. I think it's best to have an experienced beekeeper along if you have a disease situation because there are a lot of subtle symptoms that um, that, that a, a beekeeper can really help with. So um, those those brood diseases are American fowl brood, European fowl brood, sac brood, and chalk brood. So here's a photo of what is normal for for dead bees. Uh, here's a colony entrance, and on the ground we see um, we see a lot of dead bees. But this is remember that a queen can lay about a thousand eggs a day, and she's constantly replacing the population as they forage and die. And so, so we could expect possibly a thousand bees dying every day. But we don't see that because it's usually in the field, or um, or just in the en entrance area, just like this. Um, a reason we may be seeing this is that there's a flat surface here in front of the colony. If this were tall grass, nobody would even notice. But this number of dead bees is completely normal. Even this number of dead bees in front of a colony could be normal. Um, suppose the beekeeper installed a new package of bees. A package is, um, is a screened box full of adult bees that you shake into a new colony and there may be some dead bees that um, that died during transport and the bees are cleaning them out and ejecting them on into the entrance area um, this there may be in late winter early spring the bees on a warm day the house bees may be cleaning out the dead bees that died over the winter what isn't normal in this picture if if we had a video is if they were spinning on their backs or acting erratically, shaking, trembling, tongues hanging out, any, any kind of those pesticide related symptoms um, would not be normal. So it's important to gather more information and ask more questions. Okay, uh, so here's a picture of some dead bees in December. So uh, first of all, Pesticides in December is it's in our area, crops are dormant, there's not a lot of spraying going on. Bees aren't flying. They're not really and especially they're not flying to flowering crops. So pesticide incidences in December are pretty rare. So um, or unlikely. And in addition, if you look on this picture in the red and where the arrow is, you can see the these black decaying bees. They're kind of matted. And so this indicates to us that the bees have been dying over a long period of time. There are a lot of other bees that are a little more, a little less decayed. And so they, we could possibly, it could suggest that these bees are, are crashing 
or maybe it's maybe it's natural death of a very strong colony. Um, again, more information would be needed from a picture like this, but it's just unlikely that it would be pesticides, especially in December. Um, strong colonies can crash the hardest. So if I saw more dead bees than this and a lot more fresher dead bees, then um, I would look in the colony and try and to try to figure out what happened. What's not normal? So here is a picture of a lot of bees with pollen loads. Those orange balls are pollen loads on their legs that they came, so the, these are foraging bees that came back to the colony and died before they were able to get in there. The colony must have had brood, must have been healthy enough for, for brood rearing because the bees are coming back with pollen. Um, we also see some fuzzy young bees in the picture as well. And so this amount of dead bees, which should be otherwise healthy, is, is not normal. Um, Dr. Sigili will also show you a picture of bees with pollen loads and, um, and how that can be normal. So it's important to take a really close look and consider different situations. Starvation is very common. It's a very common reason to see a large pile of dead bees. Uh, this happens the most in late winter or early spring when the bees have eaten most of the winter stores and the, the colony is warming up. The queen is laying, the raising brood, and perhaps the bees can't get out to forage because it's raining or it's cold, or there simply isn't forage in the area. So in this picture, you can see the capped brood here. There, this was a this, this brown part, um, this was a really large colony. And so this can happen fast. It was, it's a large colony eating a lot. And you can see in the corners here where honey and nectar should be stored, it's empty cells. Um, if you look closely, you can see these are all uh, bees with their heads first into the cells, dead. It's very upsetting to see starvation. Here's another picture of starvation all these bee butts and um, if the bees, if the if the adults hanging onto the combs aren't dead, they will be moving very slowly, very lethargic, and it can be mistaken for pesticides because of that behavior. So um, so starvation is, is definitely something that you can mistake for pesticides and they also, they'll just fall to the bottom, on the bottom board in big, large amounts. Here's a colony autopsy that we'll do. Uh, here are uh, inches and inches of dead bees. Some a little bit older out here, um, but mostly freshly dead bees. And then we look in the colony. Here are the combs. This is a stacked colony, um, dead bees down here. And you can see some honey on the edge. And so you may think that it wasn't starvation because honey was available, but if it were a really cold winter, the colony, the cluster is going to cluster very tightly. And if the temperatures are not warm enough, they cannot even reach honey that is available to them. So sometimes it is a very sad situation when the colony does have honey, but they still starved because they just couldn't reach it. Lots and lots of clustering bees, no honey in the corners, no nectar, nothing, all empty. So this can happen on a very large scale and just take out the colony. Heads and cells, this is just a very classic symptom or classic look at what starvation looks like. And again, um, very large, this is a, a big cluster of bees and they can be just moving really slowly, very lethargic. And uh, if you pick up the, the frame, they might just all fall right off. Um, so, so you can brush off the bees and then you will see all those bee butts in the comb. Okay, now we'll go to Varroa mites, which is the, the number one reason why we have these colony crashes with a bunch of dead bees. Uh, these are different symptoms, which we have seen before with deformed wings, uncapped pupae, and of course the mite itself. If you see the mite on the frame, uh, you have a very bad infestation. It's likely you won't see mites because they're underneath the cappings uh, reproducing or they're on the underside of the adult bees. Some more symptoms, uh, we have deformed wings here and here, uncapped pupae, melty larvae. Um, 
and that could be all different kinds of meltiness and brown, different colors and uncapped pupae. Again, you may, you may or may not see this if you are, whether you're looking at a dead colony or a dying colony. So this photo is of a Varroa crash, but it looks very similar to what I just showed you in starvation. Lots of bees hanging onto the comb, inches of dead bees on the bottom board, nothing in the, in the uh, corners. So this could be easily mistaken for starvation. But if you brush the bees off, you may notice this white powder, the substance here on, this, on the roof of the cell, and that is Varroa frass or Varroa poop. And Varroa just have, it's a characteristic of what they do, they all defecate in the same place. And so we can see this and know that we have a Varroa situation here. What I also like to do is I go and I uncap these pupae here and just pull out the pupae. And, and very often I find families of mites and it's a very clear indicator that it was a Varroa crash. And, um, and it's, it's a good learning experience to show the beekeeper that that's what is happening. So, so do that with them. Okay, queenlessness, drone laying queens, laying workers. Um, um, Emily and Megan talked about this in, in great detail about um, how this can cause a colony to dwindle. So uh, drone laying queen and laying workers will only produce drone brood. Um, we did actually have a beekeeper come to us and gave they gave us a bunch of dead bees and said their colony died and they didn't know why and it was all drones. So um, the reason for that could be something like that situation or this, um, here's a picture of dead drones in front of a colony. Um, dead drones are kicked out in the winter because they don't have a role in the colony in the winter. They don't forage, they don't clean up, so they are kicked out. Um, so dead drones is normal to see. However, if you're seeing drone pupae, which these white things are, then you may have more of a problem. So take a closer look if you see something like this. Um, I've also received comb before of a beekeeper with a, a it was a dead out, and it was all it was all drone brood. So there was no queen in the colony, either that or it was a drone laying queen, and the beekeeper just didn't know. And so inexperience can can really be a factor in whether or not it's a, in what the beekeeper, in what is happening with the situation. So ask a lot of questions, think about the seasons, think about um, what may, the, the different kinds of bees and what may be happening in the hive. Um, just as a, you've seen pictures of the drones and the queens and the workers, but um, there's always confusion with drones, but just remember their entire head is made up of eyes. So if you're looking at some bees, dead bees, you're not sure what what's what, just look at those eyes and drones are the ones, almost their entire head. Okay, so back to the um, a dead adult bees, what may have happened, could have been starvation, could have been a mite infestation um, if it was not pesticides. And again, I like to rule all of this stuff out before going to pesticides. Um, queenlessness, dead drones, drone brood, or diseases. Um, don't be afraid to utilize experienced beekeepers in your area. They usually love coming out to talk bees and, and trying to diagnose a problem. So, so have them come out, especially if it's a disease situation, if you suspect something like that. Okay, so now I will uh, pass this over to uh, Dr. Sagili. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are today. So Carolyn discussed uh, eloquently various scenarios uh, that are not related to pesticides. Uh, now I'll take about five minutes or so uh, to go over symptoms of uh, pesticide poisoning and uh, also go over some other confusing scenarios uh, that maybe they look like pesticide poisoning. And uh, before I start, uh, as many of you are aware, it is difficult to differentiate uh, between symptoms resulting from pesticide poisoning uh, versus symptoms resulting from pathogens, especially viruses that cause paralysis-like symptoms, right? So, 
So here on this slide, I have listed some symptoms uh, that uh, may be encountered during pesticide poisoning incidents. Uh, and I think uh, Emily also allowed uh, or, or uh, alluded to some of these uh, in her presentation. So I'll start with the first one here, excessive number of uh, dead or dying bees in or outside the colony. Probably you're tired now. You have seen so many dead and dying bees in all the presentations until now. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll go over more detail in the next slides about that. Uh, you'll see a couple of videos I have if they play. Let's see uh, paralysis symptoms, spinning on the backs, jerky, wobbly moments, and increased defensiveness. This is a little more murky. Defensiveness could be because of genetics and so many other reasons. But if you can include this along with other symptoms that you see, probably then that might make a sense uh, when you as a pesticide investigator are looking into these colony declines. So increased defensiveness is also considered one of those symptoms of uh, pesticide poisoning. Then lack of foraging bees. Again, this is a tricky one. Uh, it could be because uh, if it was really a pesticide uh, problem, then maybe there were behavioral changes uh, that were there in those hives and you may not see many foragers. Or it could be uh, it's already been impacted well that uh, your foraging force is declined. So you don't have enough bees inside to forage as well. So lack of foraging bees is also considered one of those uh, symptoms uh, related to pesticide poisoning. And then you may sometimes encounter, and I think you saw Carolyn and others talk about as well, some immobile lethargic bees uh, crawling close to the hives. But sometimes you may see if you are called upon by a beekeeper and in a, in a, in a pollination scenario, then maybe you can also check at some of those adjoining uh, areas where there are some uh, flowering plants. Uh, because I have seen some here in Oregon where if there is an antifeedant like Poplonicamid, which is a uh, trade name is I believe Belief. Uh, in those cases, actually it's an antifeedant. So you may not see any of those uh, uh, bees which showing you paralysis like symptoms, but this being an antifeedant, those bees are pretty lethargic on the flowers. You can just touch them and they just fall. So again, you can see sometimes those symptoms even on those flowering plants that are around uh, if, if it was a case of an antifeedant. Okay, I'll uh, go to the next slide if it moves. Yeah, so here I think you saw enough of those. So here I'm again showing you some uh, excessive number of dead bees outside the hive. So again, uh, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, the time of the year is also very important, right? She was showing something in December when probably there may not be good chance of pesticide incidents. So it might be more declined due to varroa or starvation, whatever the other reasons are. Uh, but here I'm showing you something which is probably during the growing season. When I say growing season, sometime between, again, we're all in different regions. I would say taking Oregon into account, I would say anytime from March until October for us would be a more active season. So if you're seeing dead bees like this, maybe there is a problem uh, and we need to investigate more. So again, timing is really important. And uh, you may see some bees, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, uh, the tongues are protruded, or you may see some bees regurgitating some nectar. But again, these two symptoms of uh, tongues being protruded or regurgitation of nectar, it could be because of other reasons as well, right? So they're not very reliable indicators of pesticide poisoning. But if you see an excessive number of bees like this outside the hive, and it looks abnormal, then yeah, I think uh, we need to go further and investigate what's going on. So you may see something like this as well, right? Uh, it's not like you will always see this outside the hive, but you may see dead bees or uh, declining bees here inside the hive as well. So you see a, a pile of dead bees on this bottom board here inside a colony. So, so typically we see such declines in winter, again, because of row or starvation or some other problems, but uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, if during an active season, if you see a sudden decline, a swift decline in bees uh, like this inside the hive, that could be also uh, a, a possibility of a pesticide poisoning. So we need to uh, look into those bees more uh, carefully. So I'm going to show you next, which is not a pesticide poisoning incident. And I know Carolyn showed you an image where you saw a lot of dead bees along with some pollen foragers in there. But here you see not too many. There are some. Uh, I apologize if you can't see very well. But so you see all these pollen loads that are on the ground as well. And there are some dead bees. These are all uh, pollen foragers. So, so, so this is again outside the hive. 
So we encounter this scenario often in early spring or spring uh, when the weather is still cooler or uh, suboptimal with uh, low temperatures ranging anywhere between 40 or 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And we saw a lot of these uh, in the past in uh, California during almond pollination. When you know California probably you have still 65 or something and bees are foraging, but some days uh, in the morning probably get to 40 or 45 as well. So let me show a little bit closer image in the next uh, slide here. So again, you can see those pollen foragers outside, uh, but not like what Carolyn showed you with tons of bees outside uh, dead uh, on the ground. So it is hypothesized that uh, this phenomena may be due to hypothermia. Again, this is all speculation. I don't think there is any robust evidence at this time, but, but it makes a very logical uh, hypothesis here. So these bees could be either very young uh, or they were just uh, raised just before, uh, maybe a few days before they died. Uh, they, they emerged out of those cells and they could be older bees from last fall as well, right? In some areas, if you are like, uh, Michigan or somewhere, uh, then probably your uh, spring doesn't start uh, until May or so. So yeah, you may still have some bees that are older uh, that could start foraging when uh, the spring starts. So so again, uh, 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 many of you probably uh, are aware of octopamine uh, neurotransmitter. So it has been shown that octopamine uh, drives thermogenesis. So for those who are confused about thermogenesis is technically we use the term for heat production process in honeybees and other insects as well. So it appears that this octopamine depletion in uh, flight muzzles of bees uh, may lead to hypothermia in bees. So if you're seeing those young pollen foragers that I mentioned before, they are dying. Uh, so it's, it's just because those younger bees always have low levels of octopamine, octopamine in their flight muzzles and because they haven't started foraging yet, right? They, they are still very young. And, and added to that, if the weather is not uh, uh, optimal and you are looking at 40, 45 degrees or something like that, then probably that uh, cold temperature stress also adds up and you see this uh, pollen foragers just uh, barely reaching the hive and dying outside the hive. And if you are seeing more older bees, again, you have to look them very carefully. You can see those fuzzy nature of those bees which are young, but if you see uh, less hair on them, they probably are very older. So these older pollen foragers, then they might be dying because of uh, physiological senescence because they're old, and then they are again subjected to these low temperatures. Again, these are not easy things. I'm just giving you some scenarios to think about. Uh, I know pesticide kill investigations are really, really complex, and you have to look into too many parameters to really make a, a good call. Okay, uh, hope this video is working on your side. I apologize, I know I was uh, warned not to put too many videos, but I thought uh, it's really important for you to show some, see some videos. Maybe you probably haven't seen too many. Uh, I know it's running really slow, but you can see I'll point with my mouse here. So you can see this bee here twitching, twitching her legs. So these are little paralytic type symptoms where these bees are either twitching or uh, they're convulsing. So I'll allow you to watch another 30 seconds and then I'll talk a little bit more about this. So, so these are basically uh, paralysis-like symptoms. Again, uh, sometimes you may see because of some virus infection, especially paralytic viruses, there are there a couple of them. Uh, but again, you have to see how many bees are dead, right? Uh, with a virus, you may not see that many dead bees in a day or two. And if you see a pile of dead bees like this and you see those paralysis-like symptoms with twitching legs, uh, then that's probably a higher likelihood that it's a pesticide poison. And again, we have so many groups of pesticides, right? There are organophosphates, there are carbamates, there are pyrethroids, uh, there are organochlorine, uh, neonicotinoids that have been in the news in the last 10 years or so. So they all are acting on the central nervous system of the bee or, or the insects, right? So that's the reason why we see these paralytic symptoms. But each of those uh, mode of action might be a little slightly different than the other because like, for example, the organophosphates, uh, they are uh, compromising the acetyl, acetylcholine esterase enzyme, uh, whereas your organochlorines, they are uh, they are targeting your GABA receptor. So, so again, within the central nervous system, again, there are different, uh, slightly different modes of actions of these insecticides. But again, most of these groups that we use uh, as farmers or others, it's basically lead to this paralysis like symptoms.
have one more last video and then I have only one more minute left. Let me save that place. Yeah, and apologize, this video is uh, really crude because I think uh, I took this probably 12 years ago uh, without an iPhone. That was not an iPhone one and it happened very suddenly in the field. So we didn't have time to really. So you can see that be there. It's basically if you can't see really well, I can describe. So it's spinning on the back and they are holding on to any substrate they see and they're trying to sting that thing as well. And then, yeah, it's basically spinning on the backs and then being very erratic. And probably you can post this somewhere else uh, that you guys can watch as well. Uh, but I know it's hard on a webinar how these videos play. So basically what you're seeing is a bee here spinning on the backs in front of the hive. Okay, I'll stop this one here. And uh, uh, so again, as Carolyn mentioned in her uh, presentation, knowing the history of the affected colony is really important and of immense help in narrowing down your plausible causes of colony decline. So again, uh, as pesticide investigators, probably you have a hard task here because it's not so clear and uh, cut and dry. Thank you very much. Thank you to both Carolyn and Dr. Ramesh for their presentation on how to interpret hive declines when it's not related to pesticides. I think the videos are really helpful to try to conceptualize some of the abnormal movements of the bees. So now we are on our last presentation of the day and we'll be hearing from Dr. Melissa Panger, who will give an overview of the EPA guidance for inspection alleged cases of pesticide related bee incidents. Uh, Melissa is a branch chief in the Antimicrobials Division in EPA's Office of Pesticide Programs. She's been with EPA for 19 years and spent most of it as an ecological risk assessor and a senior science advisor in OPP's Environmental Fate and Effects Division. She was a field primatologist before joining the EPA and she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Florida and her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. And with that, I will hand it over to Melissa. All right, thank you so much, appreciate that. And I do get the cursor, let's see if my slides are working. Let's see. There we go, all right. So thank you for that and appreciate the introduction. And appreciate everybody hanging in there for the last talk of the day. It's been some really interesting information. Um, so uh, hopefully we can, I don't think it'll take a whole half hour. So we might get you out a little early. So what I'm gonna do is talk about, yeah, as was mentioned, the guidance for inspecting alleged cases of pesticide related bee incidents. And what I'll do is talk a little bit about the purpose of the guidance. We'll talk a little bit just high level on, on incident data in general. And then I'll walk through the guidance. And it's really split out into three main phases for an investigation, a collection of preliminary information, inspection of the affected hives, and then trying to identify and inspect sites of possible pesticide uh, use areas. So the guidance for the bee incident inspection guidance kind of grew out of some recommendations that came out of the Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee or the PPDC where um, we, we heard that there from some of the beekeepers for investigations, they thought it would be very useful for state investigators to have some additional guidance that dealt with some of the considerations or unique considerations and challenges that are related to uh, bee kill incidents. And it was the development of the guidance was led by Region 5 in the EPA and staff from Region 5, the Office of Pesticide Programs and Office of Enforcement and Compliance in EPA uh, developed the guidance. And again, it was developed really to kind of kind of address some of the unique considerations that and challenges for, for bee incidents. And it really was meant to also stay, aid in standardizing bee incident inspections across the federal, state, and tribal agencies. And it's important to note that the guidance is really intended to be a supplement or to be used in conjunction with the FIFRA inspection manual. So it's information above and beyond was provided in the FIFRA inspection manual. So I've provided the link to both those documents here, the, the FIFRA inspection manual, and then also the, the guidance for inspecting alleged cases of pesticide related bee incidents. Now, just a little bit about incident data. Um, 
Incident, EPA defines pesticide incident as any exposure or effect from a pesticide that's not expected or intended. So, um, so this is, you know, it's, it's not intended. So it's, it's effects to non-target organisms because pesticides are obviously designed to, to control or mitigate, kill pests. And so what we're talking about with an incident is something that's, that's not intended. So, so it can, a pesticide incident can involve humans, it can involve wildlife, plants, domestic animals, including pets, and other organisms like, like bees. And pesticide incident reports can tell EPA a lot of information because we do do, you know, risk assessments, ecological and human health risk assessments for every pesticide that's registered. Um, but we're using laboratory data and we're using generally exposure information that's based on modeled um, concentration. So the, what the incidents can tell us is what's happening out in the real world. So it, a really good incident data or incident information associated with an incident can give us really robust information about what happens when a pesticide is being used. And it's important to note that a pesticide incident can result from a registered use, so that somebody is following the direction, you know, directions on the label exactly. And we've heard some of the restrictions and application um, rates and things like that in, in earlier presentations that are on some of the labels. And you can get an incident from a registered use. And as a risk assessor, <laughs> that's the most interesting because it's telling you what's happening when that pesticide is being used as labeled. But they can also happen from a misuse. And if a, the label directions are not followed, this is actually a, a violation of the Federal Insecticide, fed, uh, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And so if it's, if it's from a misuse, it can actually uh, result in enforcement actions because it is a violation of FIFRA. Um, I just wanted to note here too on the incident data that information on incidents is now actually publicly available. Just for a few months ago, a month or two ago, um, EPA put uh, incident data from our incident data system on the web, our website, and I've provided a link here. And it, it provides an overview. It doesn't, it doesn't go into provide any detailed information on any specific incident, but it, it does tell you the types of incidents and severity categories associated with different chemicals um, and pesticide products. So that's, that's exciting that some of this information is now publicly available. All right, so that's just a little bit about, about incidents. And then I, I wanna talk with now about the, the actual bee guidance or bee investigation guidance. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's broken into three main phases, the investigation. So you wanna collect additional information about the incident that's been reported. You wanna inspect the affected hives, and then you wanna identify uh, you know, a possible pesticide use areas that might have resulted in pesticide exposures. So I'll talk a little bit in detail about, about each one of these as we move forward. All right, so usually you would get a bee kill incident, generally, typically from, from um, the, the beehive owner, the beekeeper. Um, so not always, but generally. And so you do want to you do want to interview the person who has provided the complaint or has reported the incident. You want to get a better understanding of the nature of the incident, what they, you know, what has happened, where exactly it occurred, um, in terms of where the the bees are, the dead or dying bees are, when it occurred. If you know, you know, if the person knows when, you know, because as we've heard, a lot of these things and timing and stuff can can. There's other things beyond pesticides that can impact the hive. You want to identify any people uh, who might be involved. So if, if the complainant, you know, saw somebody applying pesticides, you want to you want to see if you can get that person and in, in also you know interview that person. Then you want to get some information just from the the person who made the complaint. Just get a sense of what they think happened. What did they believe happened? Get get as much detail as you can. And then if if they're reporting it as a possible pesticide. Um, be killed, and you want to get an understanding of why they believe it was pesticide related. So you want to just try and really get a sense of what what the person reporting it, why they're reporting it, and what they think happened. And then you want to do a pre-inspection planning. And so you want to you want to collect before you you start doing any actual inspection. You want to you know get the information as I said on the location of the incident. You want to get information on weather data. You know, there's things like, you know, we, we've heard how the, you know, rain and cold and things like that can impact the, the hive. But uh, wind speed direction, um, rainfall, and all, all of that can also help you in identifying 
off-site movement of a pesticide from an application site. So you want to you want to try and get as much information about the weather that was happening around the time of the incident. And then you also want to get in, information on the incidents that we have in the incident data system related to pesticides. They, in in the guidance because it was uh, established back in 2013, it talks about having to obtain the incident report from EPA. But now, as I said earlier, you can actually do that search yourself on the web um, at that site that I had on this previous slide. And then that can tell you, you can look up if, if there's a suspected pesticide, you can see if there have been other reported incidents, you know, bee kill incidents associated with that pesticide. And then you want to collect and inspect all the needed personal protective equipment. Uh, to ensure safety during the inspection, because not only are you know are you might be in areas where there are pesticides, so you want to definitely be protected from that. If if you're going to be around the hives, then you want you want PPE for that also. Okay, so then you then it's the in on hive on-site hive inspection, and this starts with the interview of the beekeeper. So you want to you want to get information on was the colony or the colonies completely dead or partially affected when they were discovered. You want to document the date and time of the last inspection of the hives by the beekeeper. You want to record any feeding done by the beekeeper. And as we've heard earlier from some of the earlier presentations, these things can be important um, because there's obviously a lot of other factors that can can impact impact a hive or the colony. And then you want to obtain information on the pesticide applications that have actually been made to the hive in question. So you want to get all of that information. And then, then you can then go to inspect the hive. But it's very important, and I want people to really note this, and this is bolded in the, in the, in the guidance. You should not do a hive inspection if you're not familiar with handling bee colonies. So obviously there's some, some you know, danger involved with that from the stings, and especially if you have allergies or things like that. So you definitely don't want to do the inspection yourself if you are not an experienced uh, with handling bee colonies. So you, you know, it's good to, you can actually work with the beekeeper, local bee experts, the state apiary investigators, or anybody like that. And there's some information on the, in the guidance document on how to handle the investigation and that hive inspection if you're, if the inspector themselves are not doing that hive inspection. Um, so then, you know, whoever's doing that hive inspection wants to collect the samples of the dead and dying bees from outside and the hive entrance. And then you do, you know, want to collect bee, um, if the bees deaths occurred away from the hive, you want to visit that area where the, the, the bee, dead bees were found and sample the dead bees. And anything else that you think might be relevant, vegetation, soil, water, uh, anything that's needed. And then, so then the, the, the last part of the, the guidance is really, you're trying to then identify um, any potential sources of the pesticide. So you focus first on the sites at or immediately adjacent to the incident location because most pesticide incidents do occur where the application occur immediately adjacent to, to the application. Not always, but that's where you would want to start. Um, and then the inspector should also note sites where prior pesticide exposure to bees was possible. And so you're looking for sites where there could be pesticides and there could be bees, right, where they could overlap. So you want to consider sites where crops are frequently sprayed, sites where pesticide treated seeds have recently been planted because you can have issues with dust off from the seeds. You want to look for areas with flowering plants where there could be spray drift um, happening to them, where that that where you know would be desirable for for foraging for bees. And there is some information in the guidance on what types of plants are um, are desirable for bees for foraging. And then um, rights of way, such as utility lines or roadside drainage ditches, ditches that can get treated with pesticides and might have might have. Uh, Plants or even water that's that's desirable to the bees. So you're trying to get you're trying to see if there's any place where the bees could have overlapped with any pesticide exposures. And then you know one point I want to make is that conducting the pesticide inspections of possible sources. This is where you really do want to rely on the FIFRA inspection manual. It goes into much greater detail on, on investigating possible sources of pesticides related to the incident. Um, and you want to consider where, you know, in cases where drift or direct overspray is suspected, um, you want to you want to 
you know, collect vegetation samples or, or other residue samples to document if there's any offsite movement uh, from the pesticide application site. So that kind of walks through what, how, you know, just generally the process for the, for the specific uh, guidance for the, for the bee kills that might be related to a pesticide. But then the, the document also contains several attachments. And so like attachment one is an example of a bee related inspection outline. So it basically walks through the, the um, just bullets out the process of the bee inspections that kind of what I just walked through, it bullets it out. Um, and it's just kind of a handy little kind of guide, one, one and a half page guide uh, of kind of just bulleted out how the, the process of the inspection. Then the attachment two goes into details on sampling and sample analysis. So it goes into some details on how to, how to collect the samples that you're taking, whether it's the bees, vegetation, et cetera. Talks about you know, sample handling, storage, and analysis, and then also um, any coordination that's needed with, with laboratories. And then attachment three just provides some just general high level B basics for pesticide inspectors. It's, it's high level, not as detailed as some of the presentations we heard earlier, which were, were really interesting. It's just a little high level, just some key things to keep in mind when you're doing a, a B investigation. So it has some general information on beekeeping, bee incidents, a uh, little information on colony collapse disorder because of the timing of when the guidance came out, that was a, that was a big deal. Um, bee diseases and other factors, because as we've talked about, a part of a bee investigation when you're doing a pesticide bee investigation is eliminating other possible reasons for the bee kill. And as we've seen, there's lots of different factors that could impact, um, impact a hive and a colony. And in fact, APCO does a biannual uh, survey of pollinator management plans. And based on their survey, what they found is that uh, m most of the bee kill incidents that were originally suspected to be pesticide related actually are not related to pesticides, at least directly, that they're actually due to varroa mites, disease, um, starvation, and those types of things. So it's, it's important to have that understanding so that you can eliminate other potential factors beyond the pesticides that could have caused the, the bee kill. And then there's information in, you know, on things like death and stages of decay, because if you don't know exactly, the you know, person who reported doesn't know exactly when the incident might have happened, um, this can help you kind of determine when, when the bee kills started or the death started. Talks a little bit about pesticide exposure, effects of pesticides, some of what we heard in the previous uh, presentation, and then just some specific challenges for inspecting bee incidents. And then attachment four kind of follows that up with just some photographs. So it kind of gives you some, just some, some photos of kind of what normal things are into the different parts of a hive, the frames and what a normal bees look like and things like that. So it, it just provides a little information on what an inspector might see when they're going out to, to uh, investigate um, the hives. And then the last attachment is just an example of an on-site hive inspection checklist. So it kind of walks through the inspection process and, and provides kind of a, a way to re record the information and provides kind of little um, pieces of information, things that you want to you want to consider. Um, so it's a useful document for, for conducting a, a hive inspection. And that is the last slide. So I just wanted to thank you um, and thank the previous presenters. Those were very interesting talks. And thanks everybody for hanging in there to the to the last talk today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Melissa. And yeah, to all of our fantastic presenters today. As a reminder, the Bee Kill Inspection Guidance can be found for download in the handout section. And that concludes the webinar for today. Convening tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time again, and look forward to having you back for day two. I hope everyone has a nice meeting, nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>